Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, it is 2 p.m. and it is 119 in the Charlotte County Administrative Center. So we're going to start the meeting. We are calling it to order. And Becky, we'll start with a roll call, please. Good afternoon. Commissioner Stephen R. Deutsch. Present. Commissioner James Hurston. Present. Commissioner Christopher Constant. Here. Vice Mayor Lynn Matthews. I'm sorry. Here. Commissioner Joseph Tesea. Here. FDOT Secretary L.K. Nandam. Here. Wonderful. Thank you, Becky. We'll, we'll move on to um, our invocation. Is Pastor Jim Chandler here? Very good. Sir, come up to the microphone. If you'd all like to join, please rise for the invocation. Lord, we come to you today and we just thank you for this wonderful community that you allow us to live in, the joys and the freedoms that we experience each day. We thank you, Father, for the men and women who sacrifice their time, use their talents, uh, and serve our community to make it a great place to live. Today, Father, we pray that your guidance and wisdom will be um, upon those that are here today. Father, bless their efforts. And um, in the end, we give you all the praise and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. And Pastor Chandler's from the uh, Englewood Christian Church. Thank you. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, item four is additions or deletions to the agenda. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, MPO Board, and all our transportation planning partners. Uh, we do have a couple of additions to the agenda for today. Um, we have a walk on presentation by the Florida Department of Transportation, Transportation Systems Management and Operations, or TISMO. Um, they're going to present um, right before the FDOT report, and they're going to give us an update of uh, TSMNO MNO projects in Charlotte County. Uh, and per our conversation with our one-on-one -on -one, uh, Commissioner Constance, uh, Chair Constance, um, we added an item to the FDOT uh, joint discussion with Charlotte County for um, Vermont Road, County Road 74 safety discussion. That item was added to the agenda. And the last item is a deletion. Uh, the BPAC report, the, B, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee has not met since our uh, last time meeting in February. And we had a meeting in March where we provided that report. Uh, so we will not be repeating that report in this, this, present, this um, agenda. Very good, thank you. And I guess my book's been updated because that Vermont Road item you referenced is now item C under the Joint Local and FDOT. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Harris? Yes, sir. Commissioner Sale. Yeah, I'm showing there were three in the queue with somebody ahead of me. Uh, well, it's hard to decipher because this says Commissioner Truex, so that's me. So I'm going to get rid of that one. Um, let's see. Okay, next. So then I have uh, the administrator. So I don't see that. And then you must be Commissioner Doherty. Okay, so you're up. That's me. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Thank you for, for letting me yeah, get this I didn't this want to step on now. anyone's toes. Yes, sir. I got to the button first. Um, yeah, Mr. Harris, you mentioned there were changes to the agenda, one being Vermont Road. There was another change? Um, it was another change or a, a yes. presentation? Yes. A presentation. Was that downloaded to the website? It was. It's posted to the website. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, so I was just scrolling through looking yes. for it. So it's on there. It was. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. And I think what happened was when I reset the deliberator, whatever was in there, yeah, popped back, back up. up again. Okay. Very Is it good. working now? It's perfect. Yes, sir. You're in. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. So any further questions for Mr. Harris? Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll take a motion to amend oh, the agenda. Thank second. you. I have a motion from uh, Commissioner Deutsch and a second from Commissioner Hurston. Uh, any discussion? Any opposition? All right, we've updated the agenda, and now we're on to item number five, which is public comments on agenda items. I have some names that have been furnished. Uh, we will invite these individuals up one at a time. You'll have three minutes to speak, and it's uh, on agenda-related uh, items uh, that we're going to speak to. The first person is Mr. John Everson, speaking to uh, the Melbourne issue.
Good afternoon. John Everson. I live on Melbourne Street. I do have some flyers here you might be interested in looking at while I talk about this thing because I've come up with a different solution for Melbourne Street and the turnout from Melbourne onto Route 41. Yeah, you want to just hand those out? Thank you. Thank you. My suggestion is that as you come up on the end of Melbourne and you take a right on 41, that they create a feed lane there in that third lane coming off the bridge. It isn't three lanes off the bridge, but it's two. And one of the biggest problems right now is people come down off the two and they switch over inside because they're thinking about turning on King's Highway. So I'm suggesting we put a feed lane with a barrier there so as you come down Melbourne and you want to get out, you can get out easy. The other thing is there's a lot of people now coming from Harborview Road, <coughs> excuse me, down Melbourne and trying to get across to that first left-hand turn. And they'll sit there at the corner holding all of us up so we can't go north on 41. And all of a sudden, they'll shoot across to that first left-hand turn. And I'm suggesting we close that. I'm also suggesting if you've been down there and taken a look at what the Department of Transportation has done on clearing up that left-hand turn on the Melbourne, there's still a lot of shrubs and everything else that disrupt your whole sense of view of the cars coming down off the bridge. Also on Melbourne, I would increase the width at the end to three lanes because if you're on the other side Good of 41 afternoon. and you want to get across, you can't if there's a lot of cars turning into the gas station. By adding a third lane there, you'd be able to turn right into the uh, Whiskey Joe's and Whiskey Joe's, the exit, you would come out above where you turn into the gas station. That's pretty much my suggestions on changing it. That way you don't have to put in a new traffic light or do a lot of expressions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Well, we're, we're gonna, we'll discuss what you brought up and uh, if you wanna stick around and listen in, that'd be great. Next up, I have Mr. Tom Ansley. Did I say that right? About Vermont Road. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Tom Ansley, and my wife and I and 200 and some other folks live in Lakewood Village, which is basically the extension of Vermont Road. Uh, our issue is, of course, acceleration, deceleration, jake braking, and you name it, everything to do with trucks, primarily dump trucks. We got a proliferation of dump trucks like you would not believe. Sometimes we've seen as high as 30 to 40 of them bumper to bumper between Vermont and I-75. Uh, the noise level is astronomical. We are the first home in Hello. Lakewood Village on your left as you come in off of US 17. Uh, indications that I find as decibel levels are far exceeded as far as noise level goes. <laughs> Typically in an area like that, there should be only about 65 decibels, 65 to 67. Inside our lanai, inside, I measure continuously 72 decibels during heavy truck traffic. Uh, speed limits would help, but primarily the noise level is due to acceleration and deceleration. And that's where the issue lies with us. It's, it's astronomical. We have things vibrating on the walls from these trucks and it just never ends. They start as early, there was one I heard this morning at 2.45 a.m. And I don't know what can be done to limit truck traffic, primarily dump trucks with coming from the sand pits on down on Vermont, but it, it's making a very, very difficult situation. And that's basically what I have. I don't have any solutions for you, but it's just a very, unacceptable condition. Thank you, sir. Can you state your street name so I can just get it on the map? Because I looked up Lakewood Village and it doesn't pop Lakewood up. Village uh, doesn't have a dedicated street. It's a private subdivision, but it is the extension 
continuation of Bermont Road across US 17. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That's basically what I have right now. Thank you, sir. All right, and our, and our last uh, speaker that I have listed, but if anybody else is queued up, that's fine. We can make time for you. Mr. Richard Russell. Board members, I'm Richard Russell from Port Charlotte, and I want to address the uh, 41 in Melbourne Street, and I, I have submitted a, a proposed plan that encompasses creating a T signalized T intersection by condemning the Chevron, shifting Melbourne to the north to create a T intersection, allowing for traffic to make a left as signalized intersection for southbound wanting to go to Whiskey Joe's or to Melbourne Street. And at the same time, condemning Chevron, there's an opportunity, if it could be done, to negotiate a deal with Sunseeker for Chevron to purchase a portion of that property they own just north of the Chevron, relocate their Chevron, which would create a far corner signalized intersection, which is the ideal situation for fast food, for service stations, rather than having a goofy situation they've got now. And this is in lieu of cutting off that crossover, which would then force traffic wanting to get to Whiskey Joe's or coming back to get to Chevron or wanting to get back to Melbourne if they're going south on 41, having to go into the city of Punta Gorda, cross over, make U turns, and come back on 41, which doubles the traffic over to 41 Bridge. And I think the condemnation process for Chevron is not that difficult if Chevron doesn't want to fight it. But if they want to fight it, it's still the timeline to get it done and the time it takes DOT to approve a project would be commensurate with each other. So it's not like, gee, we, we condemn the Chevron, uh, it's going to take forever. DOT could have effectuated the intersection months or years ahead of time. No, that's not true. DOT doesn't move that fast, we know. So the condemnation would be concluded, and DOT's work could be coincidental. That beats the long-term problem that's going to fester there over the years, whether you cross off that cro crossover or not. But it's got to be designed to work for the long range. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? This is public input on agenda items only. There will be an opportunity at the end of the meeting for anybody to speak on anything they'd like, transportation related. But if anybody would like to come speak now on agenda items only, this is your opportunity. Okay. I see no one else rising. Uh, next up is the um, public, uh, number six, the public meeting, the uh, FY 2022-23. FY2324 Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. Uh, Mr. Harris, you want to go ahead and intro that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, this is our final iteration of our draft of um, UPWP, uh, the MPO's two year budget uh, for FY2023 through 2024. Uh, the UPWP has been uh, routed through all the appropriate re reviewing agencies. Um, comments that we have received, we have addressed. We have added in additional funds for transit. Um, the Technical Advisory Committee and Citizens Advisory Committee has, has also reviewed the UPWP. Uh, they um, made a motion to uh, um, bring it to the board for approval. Um, and with that, we are ready to adopt, and this will require a public meeting and roll call vote. Richard Sale. Hey, Mr. Chair, motion to hold the public meeting to receive public comments on the MPO's final uh, FY 2023 through FY 2024 Unified Planning Work Program, UPWP, Metropolitan Planning Organization Agreement. Second. Motion second. This uh, did not require 
a, a public hearing, even though it says public meeting. Did we? Re does this require? Yes. It does. Okay. Yes. So yes. Yes. I, I'm going to hold on that motion for just a second, sir. Um, so if there's no other questions, then let's go ahead and open the public hearing portion uh, of this uh, unified planning work program. Um, before the motion, is there anybody from the public w who wishes to speak on this item? I believe we'll give you five minutes since it's a public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll accept a motion to close. Motion to close public hearing. Second. I have a motion and second to close public hearing. Uh, any discussion? Is there any opposition? Very good. That passes unanimously. The public hearing is now closed. I will accept a motion, Commissioner Tseo. Uh Yeah, this is a motion to, this is to hold another public meeting. Um, I think that's going to require. It's going to require a roll call vote. Yes, but I believe his question is, is this to actually adopt it or is this to set up a, a public hearing? Well, this is to adopt it. Yes. This is to adopt. Okay. Okay. Because it says the purpose is to hold a public meeting. Right. We just we just did. Yeah. We just did. Okay. So now this is well, for adoption. We, I had a motion and a second, so I'll I'll take back my original motion. And I'll reach out the second. Okay. Yeah. So this would be a motion to adopt the FY 2023-2024 Unified Planning Work Program, UPWP Metropolitan Planning Organization Agreement, and authorize the MPO chair to sign the authorizing resolution and transmit the document to FDOT. The motion. Uh, will allow staff to make minor changes and adjustments based on comments and input received. Second. We have a motion second. Any discussion? Uh, and again, for clarification, it, the recommendation, recommendation does say to hold a public meeting, which yeah. I think we just did, yeah. and then go ahead and consider this for final adoption. So you, I saw what you read. Yeah. It's a little bit confusing. So, all right. So we have, uh, we now will, if there's no further comments or questions, uh, Becky, why don't we go ahead and do a roll call vote? Yes. Commissioner Stephen R. Deutsch. Aye. Commissioner James Hurston. <clears throat> Aye. Commissioner Christopher Hurston. <clears throat> Aye. Mayor Lynn Matthews. Aye. Commissioner Joseph Tiseo. Aye. All right, that's unanimous roll call vote. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item number seven, which is a public meeting for the FY 2022 23, FY 2627 Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, and again, we're holding the public hearing, and then we will um, m hopefully move to adopt this. Um, Mr. Harris. Yes, sir. So all MPOs are statutorily required to adopt a five-year transportation plan called the Transportation Improvement uh, Program, uh, the TIP. Uh, this is the same TIP that you guys uh, reviewed at the March uh, MPO board meeting. Uh, it outlines all the tra uh, state and capital improvements for transportation uh, in Charlotte County. Um, we have routed it through the uh, appropriate reviewing agencies, uh, addressed those comments, and uh, we're now seeking uh, adoption of the 2023 through 2027 uh, Transportation Improvement Program. And Mr. Chair, this will also require a roll call vote. Very good, sir. Any, any questions for Mr. Harris? Um, I have one, and maybe you can help me, because I know when we were talking, Mr. Harris, in our one-on-one -on -one, um, pre-agenda, there, there's project priorities, and I didn't mark the page. Yes. Is, that, is, this, is that this item? That's a separate agenda item, yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, very good. So then I'm, I'm good with this item. Uh, all right, so if there are no, uh, no questions or, or comments, then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. This is a public hearing to receive comments on the MPO's Transportation Improvement Program for fiscal year 2022-23 to fiscal year 2026-2027. Uh, anybody wishing to <coughs> speak on this item, please step forward. You'll have five minutes. This is a public hearing for this item. I see no one rising. Mr. Chair, motion to close public hearing. Second. We have a motion second to close the public hearing. Any discussion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Mr. Chair. 
Mr. Sayo. Motion to adopt the Transportation Improvement Program for FY 2022-2023 through FY 2026-2027 and authorize the MPO Chair to sign the authorizing resolution and transmit the document to FDOT and allow staff to make minor changes and adjustments based on comments and input received. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, we'll proceed with a roll call vote. Becky? Commissioner Stephen R. Deutsch. Aye. Commissioner James Hurston. Aye. Commissioner Christopher Constance. Aye. Mayor Lynn Matthews. Aye. Commissioner Joseph Tiseo. Aye. And with that unanimous vote, it passes. Uh, and now we'll move on to item number eight. Um, uh, the first section is the MPO Chair's report. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I think a lot of the things that I want to talk about we already have agended. But I would like to um, thank Mr. Uh, Everson for giving us um, some interesting ideas. And I, I, I talked about that at one point, putting that barrier wall up as a possibility so that you could have counterflow traffic. I don't know if there's enough right of way there. That's been some of the feedback I've gotten from FDOT. Um, with regard to the people waiting at Melbourne to go north to then cut over, eventually there's going to be signalization at Sunseeker. And it may be, the situation may be that they're just not going to have that left turn to do a U-turn to go back anymore. I'm thinking that once the signal's in, they'll just have a very long uh, turn lane to that light. And that's, you know, so there'll, there'll be ample time for them to get over because that light will be further down the road and easier to access. So hopefully that's the solution. Um, <clears throat> And Mr. Ansley, we're going to talk about the trucks. We're going to talk about Vermont Road soon enough, and then also that Melbourne intersection. So um, I think we can just move on uh, to the, unless there's any other questions or comments from the board here, then we'll move on to the Citizens Advisory Committee Chair's report. I see Mr. Council. How are you doing, Charlie? Afternoon. Afternoon. Charlie Council, uh, Chair of the uh, <coughs> CAC. Uh, minutes of the April meeting are in your packet. Uh, we did meet, did have a form, we're able to do business. We uh, presently have two vacancies on the, uh, on the committee, uh, one for West County, another for uh, South County. Uh, <clears throat> moving on, uh, in responding uh, at that meeting to the county's report, uh, there's been a continuing uh, concern uh, with the proposal to eliminate that uh, left turn northbound uh, uh, coming out of Rio Villa onto 41. Um, that uh, road that the traffic uh, is, is being con uh, converted to, Baynard continues to deteriorate. Uh, the shoulders are uh, eroding. Uh, the roadbed itself in several areas is starting to show uh, cracking and some collapse. Uh, the other the other part of that, other part of that is that the intersection where Baynard going north uh, comes into uh, uh, a Kia Star is typically at best a, uh, uh, a bit of a troublesome area. Uh, you have a lot of activity, you have uh, traffic coming in uh, at the light uh, from 41 South going across, you have likewise traffic coming north at the light, making the left going in. Uh, some of that traffic's making an immediate left once it uh, gets onto Rio Vila, and that turns left southbound into Baynard, maybe turning right going north, and Baynard may be going straight through, which is a major uh, ingress and aggress to, uh, to, to uh, uh, PGI. Uh, and that's, that's uh, not in season. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, layout of that is a little strange. Uh, you do as you move uh, west on the Kia Star, that, that's a long curving bend. Uh, it's very difficult to really sense traffic coming through there. So I guess the whole point is it, it, it's a real concern to, to have a, uh, uh, an, an action by FDOT that may be based upon some long-term programs or edicts or whatever to create a problem that I think that we're gonna have uh, on our city street in Ponta Gorda. That, uh, uh, it's a concern and it, uh, you'll hear this again because I think it'll be continued uh, discussion among our committee. Moving on, uh, 
Tani Merkel's uh, uh, FDOT rep report, uh, report on the uh, potential uh, new interchange in 75 uh, was, was well received. A lot of interest in that. Some questions, obviously, it's uh, very early on in the planning stage. Very interesting, uh, here in the last three or four weeks has been a lot of media uh, discussion uh, about that. And of course, I think part of it is the uh, effort to have that, uh, that uh, uh, combined uh, interest uh, in uh, both the city and the county to, uh, to move ahead with that, at least to be joined in, uh, in having the best approach. Um, as we just uh, heard from, uh, from uh, Director Harris, uh, we were happy to pass unanimously the, uh, both the uh, Unified Planning Work Program and the TIP program as well. Okay. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, thing of great interest uh, uh, was the uh, presentation on the U.S. Bicycle uh, uh, 15 alignment concept. Uh, uh, pleased to see that it's moving forward, interested in the city of Punta Gorda, uh, joining in the effort, making input to change the, uh, change the route a bit, seemed to make a lot of sense. So uh, we're looking forward, to, uh, looking forward to that, moving ahead and seeing the next step. Um, and then finally, uh, the committee was, uh, was impressed with the uh, draft of the uh, Veterans Boulevard uh, corridor planning study uh, impressed with the amount of uh, amount of study and preparation went in looking at what the existing conditions are and so forth uh, there was some uh, input uh, uh, I think the most salient uh, point made by one of our uh, committee members <coughs> was that the uh, the lack of attorney lack of turning ability on uh, Loveland Boulevard uh, at uh, veterans uh, the uh, uh, F. Dot representative, uh, the presenter, uh, did assure the committee and that particular individual that that issue would be addressed as they move to the to the uh, final draft of that plan. Uh, we look forward to that draft in June, and uh, that's our re our report uh, for the month. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Any questions from Mr. Council? Okay, thank Come you. Oh. Um, since you brought it up, it was your first subject. It it sort of. Um, you know, sort of maybe look at the agenda for today and then past agendas, and I'll, I'll address the mayor. Um, did we ever have the Rio Villa uh, 41 item on the local uh, combined local F dot agenda? And it was on and it came off, or because I mean, I don't think we've reached resolution, and maybe it should be on there. Um, I don't believe we did because it was part of the quarter vision study and. It was being discussed as a separate block of changes that are proposed to be made on 41. Um, thank you for this CAC rendering an opinion on this. Um, we continue to have accidents all the time at Akia Star and 41, not at, Bain, uh, not at Rio Villa and 41. And the unintended consequence of this closure is going to be massive because every single time I'm, I'm coming home from shopping wherever I may be, especially when I'm coming northbound on 41 to turn left onto a Kia Star, traffic backs up all the way mm -hmm. over into the turn lane on the northbound side. And I mean, I've been stuck, and I've told you guys this a number of times, I get stuck in the turn lane, before I even get into the turn lane, I'm stuck in through traffic because that backs up so far. And then people <laughs> turn onto a Kia Star, and then they wanna turn left onto Baynard to cut over to Rio Villa. It's a, it's a massive, horrible mess, it really is. And it's gonna to continue to get worse as the development continues to, to progress. Um, you know, we're at 90, 93.8, I think, development in PGI right now, but there's still a couple of massive areas of vacant land that is still to be developed in PGI, and it's only going to get worse. This was the worst year I can ever remember for traffic inside PGI, and that's only one of two ingress and egress routes in and out, and, and it's, it's seriously a major problem. I just wish I could get through to, um, to my friends at FDOT about this because it really is going to be an unintended consequence problem if that closure is done. So I, I, again, I, Ms. Council, thank you so much for, for bringing it up because it gave us an opportunity to have the discussion now yeah. without adding it to the agenda today. However, 
two things. Number one, I think we are going to add it as a combination FDOT local government item on, on the agenda moving forward until we reach resolution. And number two, I, I really agree with you that nothing should happen to that intersection until they have finished extending that left turn northbound lane to a Kia Sta. And let's see how that works. It's still not going to be effective for the other issues, mm -hmm. but at least it'll it'll cut down on some of those problems that you're talking about. But right now we're flying blind. We don't even know how good or how bad things are going to get with that particular item. We still know that you're right. As they come on to a Kia Sta, now they're trying to they're stopping and trying to make that left turn down Boehner to go to Ria Villa, or if they're smarter, they go a little further and then make some of those left turns. But you know, people are creatures of habit, and, and right now we, we just have a very constrained traffic flow within that, that location. So, uh, but I do think it needs to be on our agenda for, for continued discussion until we reach a, you know, a good, a good resolution on that. I totally agree with you. You know, we have four streets that feed into that intersection which is about 500 feet in from 41. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just a mess. It's absolutely a mess. And my, I've, I have friends that live there, um, right there at the, at the house on one of the corners there. And they, they sit there all the time in their, on their front little step, you know, front steps. And she says there's accidents there all the time, all the time. It's horrible. And it's just going to get worse. So yeah. I'm, I'm off my soapbox. I'm sorry. All right. No, that's okay. I just, I, I, we weren't, I, I didn't see us having an opportunity to have this discussion, so I figured we'd do it now since that, that, that uh, opinion came forward. Mr. Secretary, did you have something you wanted to discuss? So, uh, Mr. Chair, thanks for the opportunities. Yes, um, I, want, I want to make a few things to clarify what's going on in that area, right? Let me mention some a few things. One, we have a resurfacing project that is going to start construction, which all of this work that you're talking about is included. The median opening at Rio Villa is not going to be completely closed. It's restricted for left turns out of Rio Villa. So that means folks would have to travel north on Bernard and go to Akiesta and make a right turn. So there is not going to be any new traffic that's introduced where you would have to turn for onto Akiesta, going northbound to Akiesta and then make a left and then trying to make a left onto Bernard. We're not restricting that northbound left turn at Rio Villa. Now, the may mayor did bring up in a previous meeting about the concerns of the left turn storage, so we amended the project limits and included the extension of the left turn storage for the traffic that we predict at the intersection. So that's included in the project. So all this work is going to be done as part of a single project through our resurfacing project, which is going to go into construction soon. Okay. Well, I I appreciate your um, your update, and I mean it, it. It sounds good, but I think we still are concerned about even with allowing that northbound left turn from 41 onto onto Ria Villa. That's fine. That the amount of traffic that's going to go up to up Boehner to a Kia Star to try to get back onto 41 is going to be immense. I don't know what other options those people will have. Because the, you know they're still gonna they, they'll have to drive west to go north to go east. It's still gonna really tax the Akia Sta um, intersection with 41 for people to get on from the west going east. Hey, po point well taken, Mr. Chair. So we did. You know, I, I heard this concern at previous meetings, and I took it back to my staff and. They've evaluated, looked at what traffic is actually currently turning from Rio Villa onto US 41 going north, and then reassigned the traffic to Akiest and did the analysis. And they came back with the conclusion that it's not going to be a problem, it's going to be fine because of the amount of traffic that's using that particular street. So, um, you know, there's comprehensive evaluation that has been done, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we didn't want to go forward with a conclusion. Isolated, looking at isolated intersection, we kind of looked at a system um, basis, both intersections together, and made sure that the intersections would work fine. Did they do that March 1st? I mean, what was their what was their time period? Because if they, you know, our last meeting was two months ago, so if they they didn't do it till April 15th, well, 
there's a difference in traffic between the first three months of the year and any time you know, after tax day? We, we generally do traffic counts during peak season. Um, and I'm, not, I'm sure it's not this year. It was done, the counts probably were done before the pandemic. So. Okay. So that's, that's a little bit stale, but okay. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's move on to, um, if there's nothing further from the board here, then let's go ahead to the um, Technical Advisory Committee Chair's Report, and we have Mr. Austin. How are you, sir? Excellent. Uh, for the record, Mitchell Austin, uh, City of Punta Gorda, Principal Planner, Chair of the Technical Advisory Committee for the MPO. Um, at our last meeting, we discussed many of the items that were on uh, that are on your agenda for today. Uh, the most important of which we actually already moved through as far as the public hearing and our, our um, uh, two-year budget for the MPO, the, the Unified Planning Work Program, and also the, uh, the five-year Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, there was also a great deal of discussion regarding uh, upcoming project priorities, so that is what projects we should be prioritizing for the, the next five-year uh, transportation work program or the new fifth year of that program, and also um, a little bit of discussion regarding the, um, the U.S. Bike Route 15. Um, Otherwise, our recommendations are already included in your agenda package. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, I'd be more than happy to take those. Thank you, sir. Any questions from Mr. Austin? Sir, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for serving. All right. Uh, we will now move on to local government reports, and we'll start with 9A, which sure. is... Oh, I think we had uh, bicycle pedestrian advisory. And I think Mr. Harris told us at the beginning okay, that they didn't meet, so okay. we're, we're okay, good. but thank you. Um, okay, so item 9A, uh, Charlotte County Airport Authority and Commissioner Hurston, thank you for this wonderful big thick packet again. It's always, <laughs> it's good stuff. I, I'm not joking, I like this, go ahead. I cut it down to 36 pages. 36 pages. Yes, right. I did. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> First two pages, of course, I have my cover sheet and the table of contents. Uh, those uh, line items on that table of contents are pretty well the items that I that I do report on every uh, every meeting. If you go to uh, pages one and two, that was our meeting agenda for Thursday, April seventh, twenty twenty two. Uh, nothing really exciting on there. We um, we we did have an honor flight May fourteenth. Uh, some veterans to Washington D.C. Um, we had our annual audit presentation. And we did discuss um, the Punta Gorda Air Center county impact fees. Um, the developer was saying that he felt that um, county impact fees need to be exempt for some reason. And um, we, we, we straightened him out on that. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say your financial position is very, very strong here. Yeah. Just through three months and then your annual is amazing. Yeah, we're doing uh, very well. So pages, um, all the way up through pages uh, six gives you the balance sheet and the income statement. <clears throat> Very strong. Um, pages seven and eight are our accounts receivable. Uh, we did better in um, February than we did in January. Uh, we're catching up. Um, and then nine and sheet nine is our PFC, our passenger facility charges. Uh, we've had a PFC one which was amended once. We have a PFC two and a PFC three. The PFC two is good until 6123, and we're currently uh, collecting $4.50 per employed passenger. Um, page 10 is our um, historic monthly um, passenger report. You can see uh, over on the right bottom our, our uh, monthly total for February, and then if you go up to top left of that graph, you can see um, the 2022 curve is slightly underneath the 2020 curve. Um, so we're. But the end of the 2021 curve is above everything. You mean the 2022 no, no, curve? The 20, no, the, the oh, end yes. of November, the end of 2021, November, December, that's the highest curve ever, historically. It was actually the 2020 curve. Is the highest ever. 
know then I'm it's not. the black right but if you look at the well but you it is what? it is at the beginning but at the end of 21 it's at the end of 2020 it's the lowest so you've exceeded in 2021 you exceeded 2019 which was your highest november december and i would like to point out i did my one arrow pointing to february 2022 is right. uh, pointing to the wrong one <clears throat> Got gotcha. you. Yeah, well, it's pointing to the pink one. I see it. So uh, very good. All right, we'll move on then. Uh, page eleven. Of course, we sell av gas, jet a fuel, and airline gallons. Uh, all three categories. So you see, the av gas was up three thousand, jet a fuel was up eleven thousand, and uh, the airline fuel was up fifty six thousand. Gallons. Yes. Gallons. Amazing. Um, Page 12, you know, we do, it shows uh, all 53 sites that we currently um, operate to. Uh, I know we just recently put on Akron Canton. Um, and you can see we also um, look at our, our hangars. Um, we had basically two vacancies for the month of uh, February. Um, I'll stay on page 13 just for um, a short while. The um, That's our capital improvement project program and uh, you can see we have um, one two three four five we have five categories uh, the projects either in development we're out for bid we're in planning studies and reports we're in design or we're in construction of our projects uh, you can see we had two in two in development one out for bid two uh, planning studies seven in design and six under construction and those, um, all those um, projects are summarized on the next few pages up to approximately page uh, 30, 31, I believe. If anybody would like to end, so basically if uh, any of your constituents want to know what's uh, the projects going on there at the airport, they're summarized per sheet. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I think we're really proud of our general aviation side of the airport. Yes, Commissioner. Yes, sir, Commissioner so Thank you. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> uh, projects you had here was a self-serve fuel facility. Yes. And I remember uh, probably a year or two ago, I thought that went out to bid, but it appears now it's that was never awarded, and it looks like, just reading the notes here, uh, staff, your staff is working with certain fuel tank requirements, other meetings for power, and then it'll go back out to bid? I, re I remember there was board discussion, when I say board, not this board, the uh, Airport Authority Board, about how to actually set up the agreement, the lease agreement, and would it be tied to fuel sales, it would be a land lease, a whole host of things. It is uh, currently being constructed under the uh, new General Aviation Center terminal. So it's, it's being constructed as part of that project. Now the, um, you know, the particulars of uh, leasing agreements and that type of stuff, I can't answer that right so, now. So you're building the facility and then you're gonna lease it out or is, is that a private investor, you're just leasing them the dirt and he's gonna build the facility on site? Good question. I honestly don't. Know. I don't, okay. honestly don't know that. Okay. But I'm. I pretty sure it's just uh, we will own that. I, for some reason, I thought, um, uh, you know, because it's related to general aviation, that. Um, okay. You know, I, I, just, I just saw the update, and I remember yeah. I thought the project kind of died because they they couldn't get somebody to meet the requirements at the time that the airport was looking for, and I thought it was a straight land lease, and somebody would come in and build a facility going through some type of architecture review board through the airport authority or something to that. Just, just curious on that because, you know, you get tied up in an agreement like that, they can get pretty sticky if they're not well crafted. Especially with your experience yeah. with fuel. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for mentioning the honor flight. Um, I don't know, for those in the audience who may not know this, for the very first time, honor flight flew out of PGD on on Saturday and took 73 veterans and their guardians to Washington DC for the day to visit the memorials. And I had the distinct honor of being in attendance for the reception when they came home. And um, it, 
I was in tears. Um, I stood right where they came out of the, into the baggage claim area, and of course there were several hundred people there, and it was one of the most incredible things I've ever witnessed, and I have a video of it on my Facebook page if anybody wants to see it, but it was truly awe-inspiring, and um, the poor people that came in on the Toledo flight five minutes before our flight came in, they didn't have any idea what was going on because there were people screaming bloody murder and screaming USA, USA, USA. And it was, it was just incredible. And I just wanted to commend the airport for hosting that event. And uh, it really, it was incredible. I hope we do it many more times in the future. And I would encourage everybody to go and be there. Sure we will. All right. Um, so the only thing, so all those separate projects are listed there. And uh, starting on page 30 through through 36 is our marketing communications report and um, you'd have to call Kaylee Miller on, on on all those issues or or the things that are summarized there but other than that that's that's my report well, Mr. Thank Chairman you. thank you so much any other questions or comments all right well thank you sir I appreciate that we'll move on to uh, city of Punta Gorda Madam Mayor Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't really have much to add to my report, which you, you received, um, except that the wayfinding signage is finally just about complete. I think we're just about done putting the new signs up. Um, but that's, that's the only update since I submitted the report. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, very good, thank you. Any questions for the mayor? All right, thank you. And Commissioner Taseo, you're gonna give the Charlotte County report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Burnt Store Road, phase two, the project is complete. The engineer of record is working on the record drawings and closing out the permits with the permitting agencies. Final change order has been processed to reconcile the project balance and the contractor will be submitting a final invoice. And I'd just like to say, you know, this project was done in large part to increase safety along that corridor and the level of service. And unfortunately, as we all read in the newspaper, um, there were two fatalities out there ironically not related to the safety of the road, but a separate uh, sewer project being done by a private developer uh, outside the scope of, you know, really Charlotte County. They were doing it on their own to provide, um, you know, sewer services or um, reuse water lines to a project. So uh, just really unfortunate that that, that happened. Um, and, you know, my thoughts and prayers are, you know, go out to those families. I was reading a follow-up article. They were young men. Um, it's just really unfortunate when you, you know, you try to do a good thing with the road improvement and, you know, somebody else dies for, you know, something else working on the side of the road. Um, Olean Boulevard, uh, the work is uh, a completed work. It, we completed the mainline paving uh, on Olean Boulevard. Current work, final paving is scheduled to continue and be completed by May 10th, 2022. Contractors currently working on various deficiency items and punch list items. It's going to feel great to get this off our list. It's been on there for years, um, but it's quickly coming to a conclusion, we hope. <laughs> it says tomorrow. On yeah, the papers. yeah. Well, <laughs> it's looking very good. You know, I, I, fingers crossed, right, that we come here next time and I can say it's closed out. So um, let me see. Various intersection improvements. Well, it doesn't say which ones they are, just current work project is currently on hold. Oh, this is for the uh, FDOT corridor traffic study on Veterans Boulevard. Um, yeah, we were working with uh, FDOT uh, to incorporate Veterans Boulevard along with their corridor study for State Road 776. I believe, um, and FDOT can correct me, is that still on track to be sometime by the end of the summer, that corridor study for 776? Yes. Okay. So that's real good because the county uh, is looking forward to the results of that report so we can take next steps on Veterans Boulevard. And let's see what else. Flamingo and Edgewater widening. Um, the project will replace the existing two-lane Flamingo Boulevard from 776 to a point north of Edgewater Drive into the existing remaining section of a two-lane two Edgewater Drive from Midway Boulevard to Collingswood Boulevard with a new four-lane roadway. This project will also connect Flamingo Boulevard from its southernmost curve to the intersection of Edgewater Drive and Collingswood Boulevard, creating a new alignment for the roadways. Additionally, intersection improvements at 776 and Flamingo Boulevard will be included. Uh, current, yeah. Can I stop you for okay. one second? Um, it, you know, it it says widening of 
-hmm. Flamingo from 776 down to a point north of Edgewater. Okay, that's pretty, we, we know that's, that's a little bit fuzzy. We don't think it's gonna go very far down, but enough to be able to handle the traffic flow on and off of 776. But what concerns me is they're talking about this last statement you read, connecting Flamingo to a point at Collingswood, creating a new, a new connection, but it doesn't say four lanes. Well, it says four lanes from Midway to Collingswood, but it doesn't say four lanes. And I, I just don't want anything to be written that doesn't say four lanes. And I think we've been very clear with administration that we expect that. So well, I was going to say, yeah, I think the board of county commissioners have been pretty clear on our expectations there. So I, while the verbiage may not be in that update, I, I believe that's what yeah. we're going to need to see. I just think we need to keep restating yeah. it so that they, they make sure they understand where we are. And I see Mr. Elias standing <laughs> up on the side. Uh, cur uh, current work, Johnson Engineering has been selected as the design firm for this project. The county will work with this firm to begin designing all project phases. A meeting was held with FDOT to discuss the permitting requirements for the intersection of Flamingo Boulevard and 776. The engineer is collecting survey data and studying traffic volumes to assist in the design and access management decisions. And the reason I'm reading some of these out is there's a lot of people out there that are listening um, that may not have access to this information or didn't go online. I know these things are really important as we grow here in Charlotte County. We're seeing the congestion that we have on our streets in these four lane projects, these widening projects, improving level of service. Um, I just want everybody to know that we're engaged. We understand the issues facing Charlotte County. And uh, these are just uh, uh, some of the projects that are, you know, we're currently working on that are in the hopper. And there's more in the pipeline. So there's more to come. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Commissioner Sale? All right, very good. Uh, we will move on to uh, item number 10, which is the Florida Department of Transportation report. And, uh, yeah, we, hey, how are you? You can just go right there. Make sure that's green. Is the button green? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Right here. Hey, wait, it's green. Let me pull up your. So we have um, presentation. Yeah. four items. Uh, under F dot led discussion. So I guess we'll start with item A, US 41 at Olean. Um, Mr. Chair. So oh, the first item is going to be the oh, did um, we sneak in the transportation oh, systems. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes. The TMSO update. Tismo. Okay. And the full screen there. Yeah, I didn't get an updated agenda. I'm reading off the old one. I am too. I am too. But that's okay. We, appro we approved it. I wrote it in. I was just getting all excited because item 10 is always oh, my favorite. Yeah. So yeah. I'll wait. Uh, good afternoon, everyone on the good board. Um, we appreciate you uh, taking the time, letting us present um, some of the things that we have to share with you. We're coming here mainly to talk about the requests that the board has asked Trad District 1 Traffic Ops to look at. But we also, while we were here, we wanted to share some of our innovation strategy, plus give a really brief arterial and interstate. Um, we're doing a lot of innovative things and we wanna be able to share that with you. Um, my name is Mark Mathis. I'm the District 1 Traffic Ops Engineer. And this is Stephen Davis. He's the District 1 transportation systems management and operation tismo engineer and with that i'm going to pass it off to stephen and he's going to talk about arterial operations good afternoon so um we wanted to bring to the board uh some previous requests uh made by this body for us to look into uh, we want to let you know that we took them seriously we took our time did some analysis uh, took them back to our staff um, and really took a deep dive into them. Uh, first is the US 41 corridor uh, in Port Charlotte. Uh, we were asked to look at the side street green times uh, for a large segment of the corridor. Basically, you can see there from Harbor View all the way up to Forest Nelson. Um, our staff did a synchro model of the entire corridor. Um, as you're probably aware, this, this segment is um, synchronized and coordinated and uh, they did their best to try and optimize side street green times. Um, and we looked at altering cycle times, making cycle lengths longer. 
the cycle links out here are already 180 seconds long. Um, but it uh, going even up to a 200 second cycle um, was um, not adding a lot of benefit uh, to the corridor, talking maybe two to three seconds for the side streets. Um, what we're recommending here is uh, continuing to work with the county staff on our ATMS connection um, to the county TMC to help us and them better um, coordinate peak hour traffic and flush that, that uh, peak hour traffic through uh, and alleviate some of the congestion. Hold that thought. Commissioner Deutsch. One of my favorite intersections, 41 and Forrest Nelson. Uh, it's absurd the way the signification works there. And I've been talking about it for plus or minus about 11 years. I've sat there for two minutes and literally on occasion only seen one or two cars on 41, while cars have been backed up sometimes eight, nine, ten cars on Forrest Nelson. Because the signification of it is there, it doesn't work. It's not properly activated. Because if you have cars in the southbound lane that are allowed to make that right turn and there's no cars there, it still lets them right. We, we have the technology. We don't have to do that. And when there's no traffic on 41, the vehicles should be able to move on Forrest Nelson. And I don't care whether it's 730 in the morning. And by the way, right one block away on Quesada, at the Baptist Church, there's a church school there. And I've literally seen, probably in the teens, cars backed up that are not able to get onto 41. And because of the signification down uh, by the Lowe's traffic light on one side and midway up on the other, there's gaps in the traffic. We've got to do better. And you guys have studied it and look at it. I haven't done it from the technical end, but I've sat at that light dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and it's poor, it's ineffective, and it has to be addressed. And uh, LK is probably either hiding or smiling, because he's probably, I know he's heard me talk about this at least 10 or 15 times. But it's terrible. And the only one, well, there's two others that rival it, so while you're here, I'll share them with you. One is on 776, which I was told was fixed, and it wasn't. There were 18 cars last Friday evening on Flamingo waiting to pull out onto 776. 18 cars. And that line is, light is so long, when you make the turn from Edgewater onto Flamingo, you do the two curves, and then you have that straight stretch, you can see that light, and I'm going to guess it's about two miles away. And if that light's red, it's still red when I get there. And I could even say I'm doing the speed limit at 45 miles an hour, but few people do, so I don't want to address that. It's terrible. They're terrible. And the third one is our problem, not yours. But I'll throw it into the mix, because I've talked about it so often, is the one at Cochrane and Veterans which again, is, it's poor. We have the ability to do it right. And for example, I go through the one at, uh, at Harbor in 41, off times, at least a couple times a day. And that signification works great. The one at Edgewater and Harbor works great. I'm only a few blocks from, from, uh, from uh, uh, Edgewater on Harbor when I'm when I'm heading in an easterly direction, I take my foot off the I can take my foot off the gas unless there's an unusual amount of traffic on Edgewater. By the time I'm at the light, it changes, and then I'll go up to 41 unless there's an awful lot of traffic in that spread. It changes. It works. It works great. We have the ability to do it. But guess what? We forget about Saturdays and Sundays. We forget, uh, thank you for the head nod, because I know that's true. You know, we forget about, we have the technology to do this. And it's frustrating. You know, we, 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 we know that these roads, while, well, you know, they say the county was designed or planned for 500,000 people, uh, and we're at two now, 
but, and, and we know that, you know, uh, we, we're, we're blessed. We get the worst drivers from the 40, other 49 states for some unknown reason. Believe the only lane they can drive in is the left lane. <laughs> Un unless they're going to be making a left turn, then they're in the middle of the right lane, that rare occasion. But, I mean, and let's get some signs up on 41 and say, keep, keep right unless you're passing. We went ahead and the county upfronted the money. Uh, I remember Jim did the first sketch for us, and we actually got, ladies and gentlemen, we got a road improvement project done in less than two years. That must have set some record when we extended the turnoff lane coming up here into Murdoch. Last week, not in snowbird season, I had to wait for a turn of the light coming here from the Y at about a quarter to eight in the morning because the left line was backed all the way up to the orthopedic center and there were three cars in the other two lanes. How do we address that? You can do whatever you want with the signals. It's not going to get people out of that left lane. And, and when I talk to the sheriff, he says, well, why, why don't you get the state to put some signs up there? Of course, then we'll have to teach people how to read, so it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a complicated situation. But I was glad to see your agreement. Those are three of the worst signal situations, but there's got to be a way that we can include the change for weekends. We've got to be able to drive. I know we have the technology, and the bottom line, I guess, I'm sure is time and money. Thank you for your patience. I'm, thank you for coming, by the way. And uh, By the way, if you want to comment on any of those, I'd love to hear what you experts have to say, because I'm just an amateur with this stuff. I want Stephen to finish up a couple of points, but you actually just set us up for the next part of our presentation, so we appreciate that. Go ahead, Stephen. See, uh, do you have a PH, Stephen? A V. Oh, one of those wannabes, okay. A V for victory. <laughs> <laughs> so. I have, I have Commissioner Or um, Visceral. <laughs> just quick, Michael. If I was at the bridge or, let's say, Harborview Road traveling north on 41, is, the, is that progression timed at a certain velocity so that I can hit each light green? Your progression analysis? Yes, sir. When what? it's coordinated, it's timed for the posted speed limit. What is for the posted speed limit? So does it, does it vary? Now. Does it vary through 41 or through Port Charlotte from 55 to 45 or is it all 45? It's around 50. I'd have to look it up. I, I think it's 45 to 50 around there. So. And then second question is, uh, it's 50. <laughs> do, do you, does the system switch to an act, uh, actuated um, side street yes. allowance yes. At, at a certain time or is, it, is this always? It, we can do time of day operation. Time of day? It is. Is it 9 p.m.? When does it switch? Oh, no. I think it's... It does. It goes into free at night, but during the day, it's coordinated. So what are, what are the hours at which it's actu act actually... I don't remember we'd offhand. We'd have to look. Check for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And if we're still on this slide, are you going to talk about Olean yet? We're, yes, sir. Go, go ahead. I'll let you finish, then I have a question. Okay. Uh, next up is Harborview Road. Uh, the right turn on red restrictions. That's the RTOR. Um, this one was a little bit hard to describe, so that's why we added a picture to this slide. It might be a little small, um, but ultimately in this location, we decided to stick with the restriction uh, for safety reasons because of the driveways and the center of the intersection and the skew. Um, there were concerns with left turning vehicles coming eastbound uh, and going north and allowing those um, right turning vehicles to go north on 41. Um, and then also northbound through vehicles, stopping to turn in the driveway and allowing those right turn vehicles to proceed. This is pretty typical restriction um, at uh, dual right locations in District 1. Um, we think it helps reduce accidents and crashes, and so um, our recommendation is to keep it as is. Yes, sir. Prior to that recommendation, did you look at the traffic counts for a right turn onto 41 from Harborview prior? Was it a problem? Prior to the restriction? Yeah. Yeah, prior to this restriction. Um, I'd have to look at that and see what the yeah, I mean, history was. Yeah, if, it's, if it was restricted or you've made this recommendation because of safety reasons, were there any safety problems? Mm -hmm.
That's a lien. Okay. Yeah. So um, I guess what I'm saying is usually, you know, these recommendations are based on, you know, data driven. It's an existing condition. It's not hypothetical or theoretical. I mean, we have, we've had a right turn lane there for a very long time prior to the light improvements in the, 30 years. yeah, 30 years. So, I mean, if, if there's not data or, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say one of the main driving reasons is the skew. It's got a really severe skew. The elderly, they really struggle to turn their head and to be able to make a permissive right turn. We just don't think that that's a um, good I scenario. I think one of my colleagues said, I've been here for 40 some odd years, but that right turn lane, we've had elderly all the time I've been here. It's an elderly community. Um, if there are no accidents there because of the right turn lane in the, over the last 30 years, or there hasn't been, hasn't been problematic or consistent problems there, um, I don't know why we couldn't have just left at least that first, I think you have two right turn lanes there, at least leave the first one where you can make a right on red um, to help, yeah, to help eliminate, you know, some of that backup there and waiting for the light to change. I've been stuck at that light myself and sometimes there's no traffic and it's like, man, I wish I could just go. It seems like I'm sitting there for an extra five minutes. It may only be an extra two minutes, but you know, it's an eternity when you don't see anybody coming and it's all clear. I'm just saying, you know, are we fixing a problem that didn't exist? We could take a look at that. Um, from what I remember um, from the details, I don't believe this was restricted in the past a number of years ago, and they had to bring the restriction due to a safety issue. I just don't remember the details, yeah. but we'll look into that. And we'll yeah, I'd like to get the data on that and, and understand what the safety con I understand your safety concerns because it's a skewed intersection. But I'd be curious to see the data of accidents and actual reports, and if it's if it's trying to fix a problem that just wasn't there. I mean, if you have an accident every couple of years, or if there's an accident every month, that's a big difference. Of course. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, we even discussed. I, I know it's because they they put the improved mast arms in and and then use that as the excuse. And we even talked about well, you could post. A signal since you can't see it when you move forward you could just post a signal on the corner allowing for the turn and let that w single lane on the far right cheat all the way forward so it does have a great view because there's no lanes of traffic next to them so it's it's really kind of um, mystifying as to why this can't be solved when we we really don't perceive that there was a problem to begin with uh, I have uh, Commissioner Hurston and then Commissioner Deutsch just thank you mr. chair <clears throat> Somebody mentioned um, two lanes, two right turn lanes at that point. It was never two lanes uh, marked that way. We, it was always just one lane to turn right, and we, by our painting, added the second, the second right turn arrow. So. Uh, is it okay if I? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Mr. Secretary, absolutely. I'm gonna let you jump yeah. in. Mr. Chair, if Thank I you. may. Um, so this location has got a history, right? Like you mentioned. It used to be strain pole intersection where you got the concrete poles, the span wire, and then based on when we did a resurfacing project or in intersection improvement project that came out of the US 41 study, right? We added turn lanes and uh, that signal changed to a mass arm installation, which is the steel pole in installation. And then we could not put a pole on the other side because of utility conflicts. So we had to put the pole on the near side. When we put the pole on the near side, there's a minimum distance requirement to the signal, which puts the stop bar backwards to maintain that minimum 40-foot distance. You can see that the stop bar was relocated. And uh, with that, the conversation about the safety concerns came up, which led to the restriction of the right turn on red. And then to solve the problem, we worked with the county to create that shared right-through lane, which essentially made it a dual right turn. So that's kind of like the history behind what happened at this location. Thank you. Commissioner Hurston, you? I'm good. You're good. Okay, Commissioner Deutsch. Thank you. Yeah, arguably that's one of the two largest intersections, I think, in the county. Uh, maybe Veterans and 41 is, is close, but they're, they're huge. They're really, really big intersections. I'm tr I mean, I just so appreciate if you guys are here. And I know we get electronic numbers and we, we can count the cars that go through. In, in terms of what you're doing, and you know, and it may not be possible anywhere else, but we realize that Charlotte County is the single most important 
county in the state and of significant importance to you folks. Uh, with that being said, when you study and evaluate intersections, do you ever come out and try and drive through it other than just look at the data? We do. We do field reviews. Okay. And do you do that at random times? It, most often it's during the peak hour when the conditions are worse, but oftentimes we're okay. just several hours. That makes sense. But also during, do them during the non-peak hours because that's when you have problems. When the non-peak hours, someone does, when they don't see the traffic going by on 776, they shouldn't have to have a dozen cars backed up on Flamingo. So my suggestion is that you could contact any one of us or other folks in the county if you ever want suggestions, and we promise we won't get 50 of our friends to go out there, so don't tell us when you're going to show up. But, you know, I, I, I think, you know, random times and non-peak hours, I think, are as significant because it appears to me that the signification, and most of it is set up to deal with peak hours, but we've got to take into consideration the non-peak hours because part of our job and our responsibility, as yours is, is to safely keep traffic moving the best we possibly can. And that's going to continue to be a challenge, and it's not going to get any easier as the years go by. So just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner to say. Okay, Mr. Chair. That particular intersection, I think, has the signs that say no turn, no right turn on red. Right? So can you make those during, as a start, on non-peak hours where it flashes red? where you can make that right turn on red and, and, and collect data, see how that goes. Because I've seen some interst I've seen some like that where they flash. It's no red during certain times. Other times when they flash, you can make that right turn. And we are, as we're kind of doing that at Olean. Um, we think that that's a better location. It's a non-skewed intersection. It has the blank out sign right now, so it's set up. We could do the time of day. We just need to look at it more. I'm, I still am a little hung up on Harbor View due to the skew. Maybe I just need to get over that. Um, but I think as far as trying time of day uh, left turn restrictions, I think we're looking at that, or right turn restriction, we're looking at Olean to do that. Well, we should look at this one too because I think you're going to find the crash data doesn't support um, making it right turn, uh, you know, restrictions. Um, I, but I'll wait for that data. I'll wait to see what you guys come up with. Um, and even if you put a secondary stop bar for that inside lane up so you have your primary stop, a secondary stop bar that you don't go by, you make sure it's clear, then you go. I think I've seen applications like that. We have a double stop bar. Have you guys have that? Yes, yeah. separate stop bars. Yeah. You know, so you have a primary, then the secondary, then you make your turn. Thank I'll bring it up at the next meeting. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's, that's really an interesting solution is to at least let's try to roll it out on non-peak hours where there's just, there's just not a lot of traffic and then people are kind of pulling up to that second stop area where at that time it now says right turn on red. And so it's a blinking yellow, and you can there's there's all kinds of iterations that can be done to allow for more permissiveness on those on, at those times, and then maybe it could even be rolled back to peak hours if if the rollout makes sense. So just just to add a point to that, sure. it is a debate between the off peak and the peak because you think you have more congestion in the peak, but you typically find your worst most severe crashes and your off-peak times. That's where the speeds really get up and the severity of the crash goes up. So we gotta be, we've gotta weigh everything. Um, so it can be a little more challenging. Well, I will tell you this, again, at this particular intersection, um, it may actually work. And the reason is because that third lane, the right-hand lane is essentially being shut down because it's gonna become the feeder lane to Sunseeker people are already starting to learn and behave to get over even before Harborview. If they're not turning, they're getting into the traffic queue in the two left lanes. And so I think with that behavioral change, people are gonna stay out of that right turn, that right lane knowing that it's a turn lane. And so that may actually help. And I really, I think we're all kind of leaning on your engineering brains and saying we, we want this, so figure out how to get it done. because. Understood. 
the current situation is wasting a lot of gas, and we know that's a problem. So let's all work together on this. But please continue, because I want to talk about the next one. I think that's all we had on that one. We can continue to Olean. Uh, yes, sir. We don't have a picture up there right. for this one. Um, a similar situation as, as Mark described. Uh, we do run a right turn overlap at that intersection, meaning we overlap the dual westbound right turns with the southbound left turns. Mm -hmm. um, and we restrict those U-turns in the southbound left uh, turn lanes to try to reduce that conflict. Um, but going back to what we had said before, we'd, we'd like to consider uh, time of day right, on, right turn on red restrictions in this location because we do have better sight lines. Um, we think it's a better candidate for it. Um, so we're looking into that as well. Okay. So let me give you my personal experience today. I'm heading on only in toward 41. The light ahead of me says left turn green arrow double green go through, and two red arrows for a right turn. Explain that to me. <laughs> two red arrows for right turn lanes? Two, the two right turn lanes had red arrows, while the two green straight ahead were through traffic green, and there was a green left turn. It made absolutely no sense. Legally, you can make a right turn on a right arrow, but not on a left arrow. No, no. It was a, it was two, the, you know how that orientation is. You've got a, you're heading west on Ole and you hit 41. There's a green arrow to go left. It was green. There was a double green light for the two through traffic lanes. They were both green. And the two right turn lanes both had red arrows to go right. It couldn't have been green on the other side because you had permissive traffic going straight through. There is, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll check into it, uh, Mr. Chair, but I'm thinking when you have a double arrow like that and you have a conflicting crosswalk, if somebody pushes the button, the right turn stays red to allow to protect the pedestrian. So that's or the only so forward. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. That's the only solution. That's the only conflict that I can think of, but we'll check into it. Because yeah. what you're you explained, that's the only scenario. You're probably right. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, there was nobody crossing. And I'll be very honest with you guys. I don't even go there. I make the right turn to the, sur to the road behind the Ford dealership, and I go around, and I don't even go to that intersection anymore. It's so frustrating. It, there's got to be a better way to fix this because, you know, for sure you need to, to have more permission maybe on off times. But again, I, I don't even think the crash data supports what you guys have done there. And, and yeah, there's probably a lot less crashes now because a lot of us aren't even using the intersection. So congratulations, it worked. <laughs> yes, sir. So if somebody, if a pedestrian is using that, it would be activated by hitting the button. Or is it just automatic because you're assuming there's a pedestrian? It should, that's what I'm asking. No. Is it activated by hitting the button? It's got to be activated by using the button. Okay, because I've been there at that intersection. I had a business there for 20, 30 years, and I was here when they did those improvements. There wouldn't be anybody walking, no buttons, and I'm stuck at trying to make yeah. a right on red. <laughs> yeah. And, and to, to your point, what he's saying is if you're looking at the bank of lights, you got it's okay to go left, green arrow, go through traffic green, but you're on this side waiting, it's red. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is moving along and you're sitting there, there's nobody around, you can't make your right. And now you're stacking up to the back behind the Ford dealership, passes driveways. I could visibly see steam coming out of the windows of the cars. <laughs> yeah. I'm just telling you, the frustration level, it just, it's, not, it's not good human behavioral type stuff. It just really isn't. It, ma it makes sense to you guys on paper, it is not it is just not applicable in day to day, and it's very frustrating. So, so you said you were working on this. What's the timing of all that? When can we expect that trial or whatever you're going to do to allow right turn on red? Are we a month away, two months away? I think we can have an update for you next meeting, probably. It doesn't take long to do the analysis, so. Okay, so you're going to do an analysis and then decide whether to, to do that um, RTOR restrictions, right turn on red restrictions or not? Yeah. To ease them. To ease them. Yeah. 
the analysis doesn't take long at all, and since you know we can just input the timings and can you please use the change. microphone? Oh yeah, yeah, get closer. Thank the you. The timings we can just implement those immediately. So we just need to do the analysis for the 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 corridor and the specific intersection. So you're a couple of weeks away from the analysis. I would say so. Yes. And you make an internal decision, or do you come back to this board, or you just do it and then let us know at the next meeting that you've done it? I think we can run it and then come back and give you an update as well. Okay, and, and let our county staff know once that's done, they can report out to us what the findings of that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Deutsch. Got one more. This is going to be an easy one. This one frustrates me, too, particularly during off hours. You've got two vehicles that are going east and, east and west. Doesn't matter whether it's 41 or Edgewater, they're going east and west. This one comes up to the light. The light is still red. This one comes up to the light. The signal turns for the left signal. This car has to wait a whole full cycle before it's got a chance to make its left turn. There should be, it should be possible for us to make the adjustment that the first car there, wherever it is, which is going to trigger that left turn, if another vehicle on the opposite side comes up to it before it goes off, they should be able to make their left turn too because traffic has stopped on the major artery. And it doesn't. And that's, a, that's another, you, you know it. Can I jump in? I think that's excellent. Now, let me give you this scenario. You never said that to me in 12 let, years, Chris. In, in, <laughs> in this scenario, better than that is if somebody's waiting and now they get the arrow and there happens to be somebody also waiting, they don't get the arrow. Yeah. That's it, the thing that really that, That's my point, Chris. Yeah. It, it, the way it's set up, it has to go through a whole full cycle. And the amazing thing is, the, if it's early in the morning on a weekend, there's no traffic coming through. And you're sitting there, and I'm, not that I would say I would ever do this, but I've heard of stories that people at Edgewater and even Harbor, all right, I've done it. But you know, <laughs> you can leave that out. But the point is, you're sitting there, and it's early in the morning because I'm going to the gym and it's Sunday and there is literally no traffic on 41 and the person coming from the hospital can make that left turn and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And I don't see a white car with Shaw County Sheriff on it. So, so, so I go through and by the way, and I don't want to admit who it is. There are other people in our administration that have also done that. So if we do that and we tend to be rule players, Citizens are doing that. And there's got to be some way that we can, again, we have the sophistication and the technology that we could make that adjustment that up till the time that the, the light changes for that car, first car to make its left turn, that the guy opposite it can be included. It doesn't hurt anything, it just keeps traffic moving. Can that be done? I, I saw you nodding your head yes, so you're aware of what happens. Yes, it definitely can, can be done. Typically, we put what we call a delay on all our detectors, left turn and sometimes right turn detectors. And it's because you typically don't want somebody to be able to race up into the left lane and call that phase up. You know, you have people on the other side, they may have been waiting for, you know, 120 seconds. And so that's not quite as fair. The same as with the right turns, you don't want somebody to pull up immediately be able to send a call into the signal because they may make a permissive right turn and then now the signal has been call, called up when it doesn't need to. So and the I, delay and I, has its point, but maybe in this situation it doesn't work. I can appreciate that and I'm sure there's some logarithm, a scientific reason for the fact that there is a difference when there's no traffic coming. That 120 seconds is, a, is like 10 minutes. I mean, and you know, that's the way it hits us because it's so frustrating. There's got to be some adjustments. I know we have the tech, I don't know if you, have, if you have the time to go ahead and start doing all these, but I know we have the technology, but all those, yeah, and, they, and again, these are things that we've been talking about for years, some of these problems. So I'm just so pleased that you guys are here because I'm sure that you're going to go back and this coming week make all these changes. <laughs> All right, so here's what I'm going to request, board. Let's let them finish the presentation. There's a few things on 776, but if, if we have questions about that, let's wait till the end. So, guys, go <laughs> run through. I, I think because those, you happen to pick the ones we picked, so we appreciate you addressing them. 
we had to get it off our chest. So now, go ahead and finish your presentation. Then we'll take we'll take you guys can queue in and we'll we'll go after that. Thank you. We'll take turns beating them up. Is that? What <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so uh, 776. Uh, the first three items, um, actually two items, are uh, safety improvements. We added some protected left turn. Uh, signal heads uh, on Toledo Blade and Coliseum Boulevard uh, helped safe with there. Uh, Flamingo Boulevard, uh, we discussed earlier. Um, I do have an update there. Uh, I don't know if we want to save it till the end. We can certainly come back to it if you like. Just go, go through and, and make sure you cover it. Uh, so we did look at the timings there. We ultimately made some adjustments to the ped phasing, so we were able to add about 30 seconds to the side street. Um, when we did our field review, um, the side street was um, viewed to be clearing at the time. Um, you know, I noted the extended queue from the commissioner, um, so we'll take a look at it again with county staff to make sure that it's continuing to queue um, as we believed it was. Uh, it's not operating in free mode. It is, it is running in a, a coordinated um, fashion with the rest of that corridor. Um, and then Goldstream in Wilmington, um, there's been a request for a signal there for quite some time. Uh, that signal is with our design bill push button team and we're hopeful that it will be activated before um, school in the fall. Uh, lastly, we want to touch on the uh, Charlotte ATMS connection. Um, this is the item we alluded to earlier that we thought would bring a lot of benefit to the county uh, to allow the DOT to assist in making some of these uh, quick timing changes. Um, and Mark's got a quick update for you on that. So I think you hit on a, the entire board hit on a number of points. You know, we have a number of issues out along the corridors. You want us to take a lot of looks at it. Traditionally, what happens is we come to the board or we get a, a message from LK. He gives us the, the request. We then either have to have one of our staff or a consultant drive out here. It's about two hours one way and then drive two hours the other way. And so you don't get as much on-site time as you'd like. And so- Are the, you coming from Bartow? It's either from Bartow or from Sarasota Manatee up in the Bradenton area. And so one of the ways that we get around this is we have an initiative around our district and it's happening around the state is we're connecting to all the local TMCs and their signal and video platforms. And so we've been working with Charlotte County staff and we are now at the point we have the first step, we have the connection set up. It's not fully functional yet. Um, we can see a few cameras. But what that allows us is it's really a staff power multiplier. So now when we get these requests, instead of having to send somebody four hours, we just have somebody look on the monitor. Or if it's something, a continual problem that we're having, like Harborview, we have bank of screens down in traffic ops and we'll put that intersection up there and we'll just continuously look at it and say, okay, maybe at the peak hour it isn't a problem. Maybe it's an hour before the peak starts or maybe it's a Saturday or Sunday. This gives us the avenue to give that level of kind of coverage and dig into some of these subjects where we, we couldn't quite do that before. We just weren't as efficient. Um, as this um, connection progresses into what we call active arterial management and then ultimately into integrated corridor management where the freeways and the arterials work as one, um, we really are gonna gain a lot of the benefits that you guys are looking for. Um, one, as you see in the picture, uh, the dashboard down in the bottom left, essentially on the freeway, um, we track through our cameras and every time an incident comes, this is in my office, and the, the major incidents along the freeway come up there um, in our congested areas. And so those are some of the types of initiatives now that we're um, more fully coordinating with Charlotte County due to this connection, we should be more responsive to some of these requests. Um, and you did hit on one point and we'll, um, 
Well, I'll hit on that. Why, when you have active arterial management, which is having a TMC with operators and a timing engineer oversee um, the timings on the roadway, um, one of the reasons, if you have a major incident, say on I-75 and it's closed, you know, right now, maybe I can call the staff and within a half hour, maybe an hour, we could get a timing change done if we really needed it. The issue is, is that's too long. Um, your system would be already inundated. You, we really need to get to the point if there's a crash on I-75, within two minutes we've already adapted new signal timings along the arterials to be ready to handle that traffic flow. And so that's what we're aiming for. Um, there's a story behind this uh, graph. Um, this is really this came, we had a, in Sarasota and Manitou, we, over, we now oversee all arterial information, or arterial operations. And right before the 4th of July, I think like the Thursday before that weekend, um, LK and I, we get a bunch of calls from elected officials saying, hey, we have a parade going out on the intercoastal and we need you to help us. And we said we didn't know about that, but you know, Let's do it. And so we had our timing engineer. He actually worked that weekend. And if you look at the red line, um, and you got to hang with me for a second, um, this red line represents the past year, um, what traffic was like. And the blue line below it, that's what traffic represented after we implemented this arterial management. But this goes one step further. What we did is we took Charlotte County traffic. So this is that blue line, that Charlotte County, or the orange line is Charlotte County traffic, and that blue, we use the same projections and to show what kind of difference we may be able to make on your system for special events, off-peak hours. So I, we're really excited to be able to bring this um, capability on board and impact the traveling public. So, Mr. Chair, um, yes, sir. a couple of comments that I want to add before Mark goes into interstate operations, right? You know, the, we've, we've implemented this in Sarasota and Manatee, and it's made tremendous progress because we've actually took control of the operations and we got the right professional staff looking at it and making those adjustments, right? You know, so active arterial management is something that works. It's proven, so we are very confident it's going to help here. Going back to the comments that were made by, about the signal timing stuff, right? You know, there's, there's methodologies that are out there which defines when we should go into what we call coordinated operation and when we should leave it in free operation, which most of the comments kind of relate to that. Um, so what, what, I'm, what I would suggest my staff to do is once we go back and evaluate these requests, right, for the, particularly for the corridors within the county, we're going to work with the county staff as it relates to the recommendations of when we turn the signals into what we call coordinated operation and the others, well, what time we're going to leave it into free operation. Um, and then we're going to take the input and we're, we'll make the adjustments to what the community wants, right? But the, one, the, the thing that I want to warn of you guys is the complaints that you get from the cross street folks, right, saying, hey, I don't want to wait so long, I want to turn. Once you make that shift to free operation beyond what's recommended, then the folks who are traveling on the through traffic starts complaining. So that's a lot more folks than those who are turning, right? You know, so keep that in mind when we go forward with these recommendations, okay? All right, so interstate operations, a quick update and a celebration of some of our programs and the value they bring Charlotte County. Uh, this is a, uh, a quite a busy graph of the uh, total incidents in Charlotte County on I-75 from 2019 to 2022. Uh, you can see that uh, the 2022 line on the left graph there is the blue line. It shows that we've essentially um, caught up with and surpassed the total number of incidents we had on the interstate prior to the pandemic. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see, uh, uh, in comparison to the other coastal counties in District 1, Charlotte County accounts for about 9% of the total incidents um, in the last few years. Only 5% of those were crashes in 2020. Uh, it went up to 6% in 2021. 
and it's actually gone back down uh, on a yearly basis in 2022. So that's good news. What encompasses all others? All other incident types? Yeah. Um, it can be police activity. It can be, um, oh man, I don't know. You, you name it. We see all kind of crazy stuff out there. Uh, animals, debris, um, uh, weather events, any kind of thing that can delay traffic and slow it down. We label it as an in it. Heavy rain, you're right. It, and um, it, it goes into our log. So, uh, the Road Ranger program is a great asset for the department. Uh, we started a few years back, um, and it provides great value um, to the state. Uh, this is a, a call out of the two Road Ranger beats we have on I-75 uh, in Charlotte County. Uh, you can see the times there, uh, Monday through Friday from 7 to 7, and then Saturday, Sunday from 9 to 9 um, in the north, and then 6 to 6 and 9 to 9 in the south. Um, just wanted to point that out, uh, the amount of coverage that we're providing. Uh, the Road Ranger program um, you've probably seen these trucks out there on the road. The bottom picture is, is the typical uh, motorist assist truck, and the top truck is a, uh, a tow truck. Um, but these guys are out there literally every day putting their lives on the line for the public. Uh, in, in traffic, uh, removing shredded tires, changing tires, giving uh, uh, motorists a push off the interstate um, down the ramp. They cover um, one free tank of gas if somebody runs out of gas to get them to the next gas station. Um, we've had even instances of Road Rangers saving people's lives, pulling them from vehicles um, and giving aid until EMS has arrived. Um, but you can see there again the types of events um, there on the, on the graph. Um, crashes is actually pretty low but the debris on roadway and the disabled vehicles, that the disabled vehicle actually provides a huge um, crash mitigating uh, benefit as well to get people out of high speeds. Another great program we provide is the risk program, the rapid incident scene clearance service. Uh, this is for severe events that can't be cleared by a typical tow truck. You may have seen some of these um, types of vehicles out on the roadway, they're very large wreckers. And so we have um, some clearance time goals that we have set by the state. Um, our goal is to clear uh, the travel lanes within 90 minutes. And you can see there that we're meeting those metrics thus far uh, in Charlotte County. We're really proud of that. And it's a huge benefit because without that huge record clearing those scenes sometimes, um, it could be many, many hours until the interstate's back to full capacity. So that brings a great service. What's NTP? What's that? NTP. Notice to proceed. So that's when the, the risk contractor arrives on scene. That's how long it normally takes to give them a go-ahead by law enforcement. Uh, this is a, a summary of the risk. It in, it's uh, district-wide um, and in Charlotte County. Um, in the last few years, you can see we're, we're down in 22, which we're certainly happy to see, although it seems like every time we, we start to celebrate that, we see an uptick in activity, hopefully not this time around, but it's good to see that's going down. But the program continues to be well-funded um, by central office and will be um, moving forward. Uh, traffic incident management teams. Um, our TIM teams uh, do meet regularly. This is an in-person meeting. Um, now that we're you know, coming back to in-person meetings um, with local law enforcement, DOT, and outreach groups to um, do lessons learned, figure out how we can work uh, better together and improve on our operation in the future to save lives and clear lanes faster. Uh, lastly, going over some innovative strategies that we're particularly proud of uh, in District 1, wrong way driving update. Um, we have been installing a few new wrong way driving systems on the interstate. Um, these are, you probably noticed them on the ramps uh, in a few locations. Um, 
And this, the LED highlighted signs activate when someone drives the wrong way. Um, we're particularly proud that um, we'll have all the ramps in District 1 constructed and hopefully operational by January of next year. So we'll have 100% coverage for wrong way driving signage. And this is something uh, a really cool here. This is called traffic vision. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, it's a, it's a little hazy, but um, that's actually a, an artificial intelligence camera. And what it's doing is passively monitoring the direction of traffic on the interstate. You can actually see the red box there is a wrong way driver on the interstate. It was identified by this vision. The great thing we love about it is that it's always watching and we don't ever have enough operators uh, that can watch every inch of the interstate all the time, even though we have almost 100% camera coverage. So this system passively detects all the time and will send an alert or warning to the operators that um, it sees someone driving in the wrong direction and that unleashes a whole list of um, standard operating procedures for our TMC to alert drivers, activate FHP, um, and try to turn someone around. In this case, this driver was turned around um, and it may have saved a life. You can see how many um, wrong way driving events that we have been able to confirm there um, with this system. Um, and it's really something we're proud of. We hope to um, continue that, that program and, and roll it out further. And then a Road Ranger truck mounted camera. Uh, this is something that we added to one of our Road Ranger trucks. We're piloting it right now. Essentially what this does is it gives our operators eyes on the interstate where we don't have a camera. It allows us to get um, closer to scenes, see back into brush if there's a vehicle that's gone off the road. Um, helps with situational awareness. Um, it's linked back to the TMC via cellular modem, and this is something that District 1 is piloting, uh, and it's unique to District 1, and we hope to move forward statewide. And with that, we'll take any further questions. Uh, Commissioner Hurston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brief answer is fine, but I think, Michael, you uh, showed two bridges. One was congested. It's not, thank you. The bridge, on, yeah, that right there, um, lower right hand corner, what's a flush pattern? A flush, a flush pattern is the timing plan you would put in when you're getting your systems being inundated by the interstate being closed. It just flushes, it's try, it really gives a lot of time to the main line to flush the traffic through the system. I see, I see. Number two, you, you showed a intersection with a bunch of cameras that you were kind of proud of. Does that camera alg algorithm, can it uh, conduct traffic counts also on the turning movements? Which one, this, this picture right here? No, it was an intersection uh, kind of at the beginning and you had some, um, this yeah, that one right there, I think. But you were, ta you were talking about the connection of your cameras um, in Charlotte County tying into your system so you could make adjustments. Can, can those cameras also do traffic counts? That's the question. The ones that you have out there currently, no. Okay. Um, and I'll say that's kind of on the cutting edge of research, um, using probe data or video data to attain volume. Um, a lot of DOTs they haven't quite felt comfortable using that data, but I know there's a number of research papers that you can use either the video data or what we call Bluetooth data to approximate volumes. Very good. And one yeah. final question. Your blue curve and your orange curve that had the big spike, the left-hand column is travel time. And I thought you were, I thought you were saying that the orange curve is good. The orange curve represents the existing. Okay. The blue curve represents the conditions if active arterial management was in place. That makes sense. Thank you. So I have a couple questions. The wrong way driving <clears throat> results, was that District 1 or Charlotte County? The implement. No, the, the, yeah, the, the, the red bars, you were giving us some data. Keep going. Right there. Is that District 1 or is that Charlotte County? That's all of District 1. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, that, 
be thinking that's a lot of people driving the wrong way. Is that a, is that the last year or is that per? Uh, that's that's only two quarters. Two quarters. Okay. Um, okay, and then, so I guess it, it, is the headline Skynet saves lives. I mean, if you're you know, I'm not a big Terminator fan, but you know, you're telling me that AI is actually watching these intersections and making sure that these wrong way folks they're they're getting identified immediately because you don't have a human being. Yes. Right? And on the interstate, we are using AI to identify wrong way drivers. Okay. So, and it's, and I, I know Stephen, he kind of beat around. I argue this did save a life. This computer identified this, what you're looking at. We were able to call FHP. FHP was able to send a cruiser out and stop them in lane as they were in. They were not stopping. So it really took a active engagement to have it. A difference. You, you realize, though, in the future, there's enough Big Brother stuff going on that you'll actually be able to call the phone in that car. The, the computer will actually r figure out the device that's in that car, and if it's on, it'll actually be able to call it up, and it'll ring, and they'll say, you're driving the wrong way, and they'll look around and try to figure it out. But, you know, that's where we're headed, and that, that may not be such a bad thing. But I, but I had written this down before you even showed us this part, because I'm thinking if you're linking into the, the traffic management center, you know, we should be able to implement some sort of AI to do the traffic counts, to look at these things real time and, and look at the inter interactions, because it needs to be done 24-7. And I agree with the secretary, you know, if we start relaxing the, um, the algorithm so that you can have traffic trip, I'm okay with that as long as that traffic light is interacting with the traffic center and the traffic center is saying, okay, we're going to trip this light earlier, but there's four cars coming. We're going to wait for those four cars to move through and then we're going to activate the trip. I'm always the car that's heading down and the guy pulls in at, and then boom, the traffic is, and I have to stop because he's tripped that light and there's not enough of a delay, but it can't be a delay. It has to actually know the traffic that's coming. And if we're really going to do the right thing, then the systems we're putting online and paying for have to go that, that final step and be looking at devices, okay, and looking at, because that's really what it's about. It's not, it's not cars tripping the pavement. It's actually looking at devices. I mean, you have all these cars that are subscribing to Waze and all these different things. There's a way of keying into that, not taking their rights away, but actually looking at better delivery of traffic control systems. So are, are we are we there yet? We we are coordinated. We're integrated with Waze. We provide them data, and I think we also get data from them and Google Maps. So we're integrated with them. Um, I would say this this is the bleeding edge. You're looking at cutting edge. We've yes. evaluated other video analytics, and I have to say some of them, most of them, don't live up to expectations. Yeah. This one did, so it's really nice to see as some of these technology what we can do. Well, we were very fortunate when we when we were going through the M MCORS, I call it MCORS exercise now, but we had a professor from UF. We had a lot of different folks showing us the cutting edge stuff, and it's very impressive. And I, and I I think it needs to get rolled out faster because it it's there and it's going to really help us on a lot of fronts, right? Not wasting energy, keeping people safer. I mean, it's, it's, I don't see a downside to it. Mr. Secretary, you have a comment? So Mr. Chair, um, I, I think you're specifically talking about what we have in Charlotte County on the arterials. Can we actually do this kind of AI stuff, right? The system that we installed in Charlotte County is like, what, 15 years old? Little, little over 15 years old, right? So the technology, is a little bit outdated in that you know it's 15 years old but the system is capable of doing good things right you know that's why we are trying to leverage the camera feeds that we have to make those judgment decisions to make those timing adjustments but to get to the level that you're talking about it would have to be a rehaul of the system in charlotte county thank you sir thank commissioner you. deutsch with the wrong way vehicle and probably be about two years. The next step is that you take control of that vehicle, instantly put it on the side of the road and turn off the engine. <laughs> and, you know, sort of with what Chris was talking about, that concept of being able to get directly into the car, and we, we, we have it now. We're getting real close to that stuff. But that's going to be the next step. You don't have to send 
you know, the trooper out there, just that it, they put them on the side of the road and turn the engine off. We do have a number of initiatives. What you're talking about, I think, is connected vehicle, and we have at least half a dozen of those projects going on in our district. And I, I think that's the thing that obviously is going to be with us in probably three, four years. And we were also developing a district-wide connected vehicle master plan to try and conglomerate all these technologies and vendors together and install hardware that connects across all these different companies and provides that kind of a seamless. Well, the final question to the three of you, can we keep up with the technology because it's advancing and changing so quickly? So I'm going to answer that. I was hoping you would. Okay. So, uh, FDOD is always at the cutting edge, right? You know, I got to say that because we are the lead in the nation as it relates to keeping up with technology. Um, but then implementing of the technology can you hear me, Commissioner? Oh, yeah. so, so implementing of the technology is really dependent on how much funding we have available and how fast we can implement, right? You know, so that's, that's the challenge that we have. Thank you. Commissioner Tuseo. Yeah. So FDOT is up on all the cutting edge technology, but we can't make a right on red. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> so. To the point about technology, the private sector has developed autopilot. That technology will be as standard as airbags are in vehicles in, in five years, no later than 10, but I'm sure over the next five years, you'll be able to get standard autopilot technology. Once it's activated, it won't let you go down a wrong way street. It knows the maps, it's integrated into the system. It's meant to essentially drive the car and you're there to monitor the interaction, you know, in case you need to grab the wheel. That technology Tesla has now, they rolled it out, but I think they're still perfecting some of that. But it's, like I said, in five years, it'll be like airbags. It'll probably be in the standard entry-level package, some type of autopilot technology. You know, so, so I think that'll help solve a lot of those, those problems down the road. So, so autopilot, will that override your tendency to speed? Because you know that autonomous vehicles won't speed. Autonomous vehicles, if it's 55, they go 55 or 54. That's it. If it's... So, how do you it's only as good as a user, just right. like my car now. I have a six year old car, but you can deactivate some of the safety features on it and go all manual. Yep. You know, it'll help you do cruise control, it'll stop you, keep you the distance. You know, all that technology is there, but the autopilot that will be standard whether you use it or not. That's a different story. Well, the insurance companies will make you use it because it's safer and you'll have to pay a lot of money if you want to actually drive your car. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more, thank you, sir. One and it won't let him make a turn on the race. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get it to go. Very funny. Um, last question, just uh, real quick. The uh, Road Ranger 78 and then 910, the break. Is the break at Harborview or is the break at Kings Highway? I'm just curious. What exit is that break at? I think it's at Kings Highway. Kings Highway, okay, very good. Just eyeballing it. I can get you that answer. All right, now, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. It's, that would probably make the most sense, but. All right, any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you. Very comprehensive. Thank you for fielding all of our questions. We really appreciate the, the presentation. Uh, it was last minute, but it was, it was very insightful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for your, your answers. Appreciate that. All right, uh, now we're going to move on, uh, if there's no more comments or questions, to the Florida Department of Transportation report, item number 10. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to make a couple of comments and then I'll turn it over to Victoria. So, to go over the list. So, um, Governor DeSantis uh, appointed a new Transportation Secretary for DOT. So, if you remember, our previous Secretary, Kevin Thiebaud, left um, to be the Executive Director for the Orlando uh, Airport, right? We call it GOA. So, um, Jared Perdue, who was my counterpart in District 5 in the Orlando area, so he was appointed as the State Transportation Secretary, uh, effective April 7th, I think. So, um, so he's a, he's a very um, community-focused individual, collaborative, you know, um, really depends on partnerships to make things happen. So I think you, get, you, you know, all the communities within the state of Florida is going to enjoy him. Um, and then we do have a new Assistant Secretary, Will Watts. Uh, he was the chief engineer, um, so Courtney Drummond, who was the previous assistant secretary, he left 
the department to go into the private sector. So uh, Will Watts was appointed as the assistant secretary over engineering and operations. So we have a, a new assistant secretary. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is our federal allocations. Uh, you know, as you know, Florida is supposed to receive about 35% increase in formula allocations, leaving let alone the discretionary programs where we have grant opportunities, right? So we have not received our federal allocations at the district level, so we're still waiting on that. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to mention, you know, we, we've all talked about this revenue increases both at the state level and the increase in allocations coming at the federal level. Um, I do want to forewarn you about the impact of the cost estimate increases and the bid pricing that we are getting. Um, we are receiving higher bids on a consistent basis for all of our projects. I think every community is seeing that uh, with the inflation and the supply chain issues, with the labor, lack of labor force, you know, all these things are kind of coming together and uh, we are um, seeing high bid prices. As a result, our cost estimates are going up. So as we work towards the building our next five-year program, what we anticipate is, uh, you know, the increases is going to help stabilize the program and the demand on uh, keeping our system with the resurfacing program uh, that we have, that particular demand is not coming down. So the number of lane miles we need to resurface is still maintained. So um, the projections are still maintaining. So all these things are gonna to come together and what we're gonna see is, you know, this increase in revenue is gonna help us stabilize the program, right? Having said that, there's still the grant opportunities for the discretionary programs that was rolled out as part of this uh, infrastructure bill that was passed, right? You know, so those are the opportunities that we think we need to go after for projects like Harbor View, right? You know, so uh, one of the things that we've done is put our collective resources together so that we can get it production ready or shovel ready, right? So um, the more projects we do that, the more opportunities we have to go um, go after those grant programs. So um, just wanted to give you that information so that we kind of set our expectations right before we get into this development of our work program. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Victoria Peters from the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, wanted to uh, update you and let you know that District 1 is planning studio will be hosting a speed management workshop focusing on safe speeds and countermeasures which we may use to address the speeding challenges which face us all today. Safe speeds are one of the five elements in the safe systems approach being used as we work towards driving down fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. So this workshop is going to be June 14th from 8.30 to 4.30 and that's the date of the workshop and that will be held at actually our Sueo building that would stands for the Southwest Area Office, and that is on Daniels Parkway. So if you know where the Daniels Rest Area is, it's a large building in back of the Daniels Rest, excuse me, the Daniels Rest Area. Um, and we will also be holding one at the Manatee Operations Center in Sarasota on September 13th. That's if you can't make the June one. I don't know which one. I think the Soya one might be a little closer for you folks. I also wanted to update you on where we're now on our work program cycle. So, um, you know, our cycle runs on five years. And we're currently getting um, FY, I believe it's 24 to 27 adopted by the governor on July 1st. So our last work program that you saw will become the adopted work program. So now this summer we'll be gearing up to add in our new fifth year, uh, which goes, which is actually FY 28. So as we move into 28, the current year will drop off and we've received new project applications from our MPOs and local municipalities. And we have an engineering group that we call our 4P engineering group and they vet our, cons our applications and they provide us our constructability review so that we can move forward with program these when we're, when we're programming for our new fifth year of 28. So moving along to the list of projects, um, the first list on the FDOT led discussion is item A, US 41 at Ole Olean Boulevard. Um, so our traffic ops um, updated you on some of the thing, the items that you're interested in. Um, at this time, we don't have any other in, in additional information on this and we'll come back to you in the future with more. 
Um, on State Road 776 at Flamingo, I know that was also part of the um, discussion today. Um, and internally, we're also having discussions with the county with their efforts on Flamingo. And there's no other information right now, but we'll bring it back at ne next month report or the month after that if we have anything else to share with you. But we have ongoing discussions with the county. Um, for the Charlotte Sports Park, item C, the intersection improvements. This project was moved out from our work program cycle and we will be reviewing opportunities to bring it back moving forward. Now the master plan studies. Um, so I wanted to give you an update on the meeting that we had with the master plan studies. A meeting between FDOT Interstate Program Office, or you might hear it's called IPO, and Charlotte County, Charlotte Punta Gorda MPO, Sarasota Manatee MPO, Sarasota County, and the City of Northport staff and the local municipalities was held on April 6, 2022. The purpose of this meeting was to facilitate coordination between all stakeholders regarding the need for a new I-75 interchange in the vicinity of Yorkshire Raintree. Some of the action items and direction arose out of this meeting from the local agencies was to coordinate and develop one or multiple alternatives to improve regional connectivity and to land on the same page and provide this information to our IPO team. Alternatives need to be identified and proposed classifications and typical sections of roadways. Once that occurs, FDOT will perform a feasibility analysis on alter alternatives once developed. Once the coordination between all the lo local municipalities occur, we will discuss detailed next steps for the IPO to complete the feasibility analysis. And our IPO office looks forward to receiving an update on the coordinated options compiled by Sarasota, Manatee, City of Northport, Charlotte County, and the Charlotte MPO. So moving on um, with the joint local and FDOT discussion. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Sure. Um, I just before we move on to the joint ones, I just wanted to go over um, 776 and Charlotte Sports Park improvements. I remember when that did get pulled. Can you refresh my memory on how we're going to revisit that or the timing on that? I remember it, it did get pulled at our last meeting for certain reasons. Can I get an update on that? I can give you an update or um, the next uh, Tanya, Ms. Merkel, give oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Commissioner, we can come back to you on that one, but the reason that the project was, oh, uh, Wayne Gaither uh, with FDOT for the record. The reason the project was uh, moved out was to balance, uh, in an effort to balance the budget. Right. And we will make uh, every effort as time allows to bring those projects that got deferred out back in um, as they were moved out on um, uh, fiscal constraints. Right, so I, I remember that. Um, but I guess my question is, when do you have a clearer picture on when you can revisit that and put it back in? Do we have to wait like a, another year, two years, or a certain uh, fiscal time period we have to wait on to see if funding's available? That I don't have a uh, answer that I can share with you today. Uh, I can tell you though that we are continuously watching our budget to see when the opportunity will arise. That's the, the projects that did get moved out we will be in touch with you on how we can get those projects moved back in again. Yeah, I just wanted to temper my expectations on that. That that particular improvement we thought would really help alleviate some of the stacking and issues we have during event time at, at the sports park and the communities really, we get a lot of feedback on, on that particular issue. And I just, you know, if it's a year, two years, I didn't want to keep hounding FDOT. I know it's, it's still on here for discussion, but I just didn't know if it was something we'll know, have a better, clearer picture over the next six months I know the state has, you know, the budget is, you know, flush with funding. I know there's federal money coming in for infrastructure. I don't know if that's changed the, the picture for FDOT with some of that infrastructure money coming in. But I'm sure everybody's got their hand out. <laughs> so. Mr. Secretary. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, <clears throat> as we go forward with the work program development cycle that Vic mentioned, um, we should have a better understanding of what funding is available, right, uh, Commissioner? Um, the, the funding that was moved out for the Charlotte Sports Park was design money. It was about $300,000. So to bring back the design, it should not be that big of a challenge. So we'll look for opportunities. Okay. But the, 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 the thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, we finished the study for State Road 776, right? You know, there were several other intersections that were identified with improvements in addition to this particular one. Um, so at some point, you know, after we finish getting the input from county staff, the MPO board will have to make a decision on 
which ones are your priorities and communicate that to your staff so that you know the applications that they put forth to us right you know will follow that particular priority list and i don't know where this charlotte sports park is going to fall in the under those priorities you may choose to put it as right. a top priority but i i do want to bring that dynamic into the picture thank you mr thank you and um I guess my, my question uh, relates to the last item um, where we're still discussing these intersections or possibly one or two new intersections at Raintree, Yorkshire, whatever. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to, it was brought forward that we should be looking at how that will cross over to Kings Highway. And so the shortest route looks like um, you know, possibly using commercial way but I, I don't know if we've gone that far down or it's a lot longer, but you can sort of go along the southern border of the Water Authority property if you need land. But, you know, I, I think that's got to be part of that discussion, too, because I think it elevates the ranking of that intersection if there is that, that crossover. So I, I, I just would love for staff to tell me that we are actually looking at that. Yeah. So there's a sh so at the end of Rain Tree there there's a um, there's a road just above that at the t northern edge of that um, water feature and that that road there that goes to Kings Highway is Commercial Way but are we even looking at what what the connection looks like have we have we started that process so so from that coordination meeting with uh, Katie Sherrod and the interchange team uh, so they they were very clear that they wanted us to look at um, of the gamut of um, possible solutions of uh, to improve regional connectivity. Uh, so we are having a um, coordination meeting with the city of Northport, Sarasota County, Sarasota, uh, Charlotte County, and Charlotte County staff. That's scheduled for June 9th. And at that meeting, we're going to uh, refresh uh, where we are with the uh, proposed interchange and also start looking at different solutions. So, and part, I'm going to have John speak, but hang on a second because everything we're talking about is in DeSoto County. So we need to bring them into the conversation because part of this is in our urban service area, but that road may not be. So they're not even in our, they're in the, they're in a TPO, I think in the Heartland TPO or something. So we've got to think about reaching out to them as well. John? For the record, John Elias, Public Works Director. So um, to tag on to what Mr. Harris said, we are looking, this is very high level conceptual stuff, but we're trying to look at all avenues, including uh, Mr. Fackley, our transportation engineer, did just let me know that we've also already reached out to DeSoto County. Perfect. Great. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah, Commissioner. Yeah, to your point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe what FDOT wanted to see was more of a coordinated effort with the city of Northport. Right. They made that clear. We had two city of Northport members here, and we've directed staff as a board to set up a joint meeting with the top of conversation being the interchange. So we can give clear supportive direction from the municipality and Charlotte County to at least say we're on board with this, then we can get to the point where we're doing concepts or moving forward with, with, with the state. So right. I think we started the ball rolling once we have that meeting. Right, we're fine at the MPO to MPO level, we need to go Charlotte County to City of North Right. Port. That's what they want. Those are the boots on the ground, and, and we've and never DeSoto had an County. official meeting, and it's not just administrators talking. Well, that's a good, you know, this is the first time I heard DeSoto County. I, I completely left that out of the equation. That, yeah. that probably is a really good point. We, we, we probably need to get with them and get them in. Maybe it can be a joint meeting with Northport and DeSoto County, and we can get all of us together instead of having another, an additional meeting. That's probably not a bad idea. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so we went through the, give me a second here, we went through the uh, FDOT-led discussion, um, and I guess now let's move on to the joint local and FDOT discussion. Thank you. For the record, Victoria Peters from FDOT. So to start the discussion, we're looking at Harborview Road Combined Funding Study. Um, FDOT will continue to look for all funding opportunities on this project to move the project forward. FDOT project managers and county staff are continuing to meet on this project right now. And we, we just want to make sure you are aware that 
Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I think I was looking down. But so, so we, we did identify a couple things. Um, with regard to, to this road, there's going to be uh, improvement of infrastructure with regard to a water line, a water main that's coming down from the Charlotte Harbor Water Association. But at a recent uh, county utility meeting, <clears throat> we identified the fact that actually we're probably going to look at putting a sewer line in there as well. So that will take additional coordination. I'm not concerned that we're going to be ready tomorrow because we're not. But you know, hopefully that event horizon for actually opening the trench will will allow all of us to be coordinating to get those utilities in on the front end. Um, you know, in coordination because we don't want to be doing it twice. So just just so you're aware, there's now a sewer a sewering aspect to this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next item is US 41 southbound at Melbourne Street. So we've received a lot of feedback and discussions on this project. FDOT will need to have meetings with your county staff as well as FDOT, FDOT staff to move forward. Okay. And, you know, Mr. Elias, you have a comment? So, um, John Elias again for the record. Just on, the, on that same topic, um, our team already met with our contractor for the landscaping and they look like they were out there today but my team said by Wednesday they should be started to remove a whole section of landscaping to, to hypothetically improve visibility. I still think it's more of a geometry issue and we've also reached out with uh, FDOT staff and Ferrovial to do some stuff between the bridges where there might be some existing um, native and non-native vegetation growing up and try to remove that as well to try to make sure we're eliminating any potential sight lines. Really appreciate that. I really appreciate you bringing up that vegetation issue at our last meeting because that's something that I don't think we were th really thinking about because to control it, you got to be underneath. But I'm 100% in agreement. It's a geometry issue. And I don't think there's anything we can do short of closing that intersection to make it safe because it's all about judgment. It's all about, you know, somebody thinking they have a, a, the, the ability to make it and not realizing and judging that the person coming off the bridge is flying. So, you know, I, I don't think we can control any of that. And so in order to make it as safe as possible, I think we're moving in the right direction. Commissioner Say, you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know, the proposal was floated as a possibility to close that left-hand turn lane, but it wasn't really studied or looked at or there wasn't an official recommendation to close it. It was just thrown out there as an option and I just want to make sure that the unintended consequences of closing it are, are clearly understood. So I just want to make sure that FDOT, and I, and I just want to, you know, hear from the secretary, um, that right now you're not closing that left-hand turn lane. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, so we are not closing that left turn lane. I, I, I mentioned it as a suggestion because it's a directional median opening. It's a left turn and there are alternate ways to get to the community, right? That's the reason why I mentioned it. Um, but I would agree with you, Commissioner. You know, you would have to do some traffic counts to figure out, okay, what is the traffic numbers and where would they go, what the impact is, just like we, we do with any other median closure. Right. So I would, you know, I, in this case, you know, because it's a county road, uh, I would say the county would take lead on it and then we'll support them. Okay. Yeah, yeah because I'm, I'm not gonna close a turn lane until I understand what's going on. We have no information other than we have some visibility issues which we're working on. It may be a geometry question, but just, just for the record, DOT has not ordered the closing of that intersection in, in the near future or in the future. It's not even on the table until it's on the table. It's, it's a possibility, right. definitely a solution, yeah. um, but it's got to be vetted. Right. Okay. And, and just before I go to the mayor, uh, it's, it's, there's no way we could ever put a signal there. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. I just want to get that on the record, too, because it's been floated a number of times. If we buy the gas station and do all this stuff, we cannot put a signal there at the foot of the bridge. We, the, uh, we would not recommend that because of obvious geometric concerns that, you, that was mentioned before and with the signal that's going at Sunseeker Resort. Yeah. And, right. be, and before I give up the floor, I just wanted to say I certainly wouldn't want to send the traffic to the city of Ponte Gorda because 
for people who overshoot that and don't realize it's closed and you're going to get a lot of people, they're going to end up on the other side of the bridge and they're going to have to figure out how to get back and it's going to create congestion, whether through U-turn, making a right and then circling around, getting to another signal to get their way back north and come in the back way. So, I mean, there's a whole host of things that we haven't even looked at. Right. And, and I know that was floated as a solution, right. but we weren't given direction. Right. We didn't give them direction to close it, and it's not happening. But, but, but understand, so. understand when the signal goes in, there, there can also be signage that says, last turn before the, you know, you, pe people will be educated that when they get to that light, they, there, is no, there is no turn. You can go into Sunseeker and, and turn around, or, but if you're heading over, the, you know, it, it'll say, you know, next stop Punta Gorda. I mean, I think there's a way to educate folks so that you won't have those unintended consequences. And over time, you know, the GPS is going to not allow people to go over the bridge. Thank but you, Chair. Thank you. Madam, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, speaking from the city's standpoint on all of this, um, I, I look, I've had a lot of comments I've received since it hit the newspaper um, a while ago. But most importantly, um, when, if and when the project that's on the table gets developed on the city marketplace, um, Red Esplanade may or may not be a through road after that point in time because they're talking about closing down a majority of it between Taylor and 41 northbound. So um, that would not be an option if the people had to come over the bridge and try to get back out of Punta Gorda. So that's, that's a big problem because then you're going to be funneling. The only other option would be to go all the way to Olympia, do a left and do a left on 41 northbound. It's going to be a traffic disaster waiting to happen. Um, but just as importantly, um, if and when Whiskey Joe's does get developed, um, I can't imagine that they would be agreeable to not being able to have access to southbound traffic on 41. So that could be a serious problem for them. Uh, and also, um, we're talking about doing all this major expansion on Harborview Road so that people can get to the interstate for those going southbound. Why would they go north to go south? Because they would have to otherwise go to, um, out to Kings Highway and turn right on Harborview or go straight out Kings Highway to go north. Um, so it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. I just think that's a bad option to close that down. Well, actually, but you just made an argument for why to close it because if you have all these folks leaving Sunseeker, that are now going to head to Melbourne to go north to Harbor. I don't want any of them doing that. I want them to go to the lighted Sunseeker and go, and the Secretary's nodding. I mean, it's the safest route is to go to Kings Highway, go up to Harborview. Yes, it's a little bit a, a, a little bit out of the way, but it's the safest way to move all of that traffic out of the area. I don't disagree with that. However, it's not the nature of people. They're going to want to go the shortest distance between two points. But their, their GPS is not going to let them do it. I mean, their computer is going to tell them, you, you, you know, you're going to wind up going south and hitting the bridge. Okay, well, my point, I guess my biggest point was please don't bring them to Punta Gorda and have, <laughs> have to have them go through Punta Gorda to get back out, of, uh, gotcha. you know, and go back over the bridge. I guess that was the biggest point I wanted to make. Mr. Secretary, Thank yes, you. sir. Mr. Chair, I was going to say, Mayor, you want them in there because they would fix, stop, park, and well, eat, yeah. do yeah, whatever, you know. Take so. a breather. <laughs> <laughs> Contribute to the economy, yeah. yeah Okay, so, um, all right, so we're now at, uh, I think we've talked that one out, so now item C, Vermont Road, safety discussion. And thank you for letting us add this. Well, thank you so much. Again, for the record, it's Victoria Peters from FDOT. So I have the Vermont Road safety discussion. I don't have anything on this item right now, but we can bring something back. Or... So, thank you. So, Mr., we, we just wanted to, th this is here so we can start the conversation. We don't expect anything other than we're going to ask a lot of questions and hopefully hear back at the next meeting. But Mr. Elias, you, have, you want to say something? Sorry, again, for the record, John Elias, Public Works Director. So administration from the conversation at the last board meeting we had, um, we've already directed our team and we've had meetings, two meetings on it, one this morning. Um, we're going to move this up into our CNA. We're actually going to work with real estate services to start putting together some numbers for potential right-of-way acquisition and just looking at a number. And I believe I, this is super preliminary, but um, administration's already met with the FDOT and we're looking at options there. So we're, we're, we're definitely moving this forward to try to present as many options as we can to our board. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Deutsch. Thank you. The problem with Vermont Road and uh, is the fact with all the construction, the mines as active as they are. And I've said this at the commission meeting. We have an incredible amount of traffic out there. 
the construction is moving, the mines are operating, there's dump trucks on that road. Uh, there are no shoulders on that road. We all know how bad it is. We all know the accidents that, I, and my guess is there's probably more during daylight hours than at nighttime. Uh, and we also all know all of the trucks and produce trucks, and like it's, it's a main artery, and, and, and they use that. And there's no place for the cars to go. And I'm not sure if speed limit works. Uh, Chris and I, I don't know what you experienced, Chris. I left around 1 o'clock. We, we went to the, uh, the opening of Iguana Land out on Vermont Road. And uh, what's it, about six miles, I guess, from 17 that you've got somewhere around that, on that stretch of road. And uh, I, I was coming back Saturday afternoon for another event, uh, uh, veterans thing. And I'm coming back around 1 o'clock, not a lot of traffic, a couple of trucks. I'm doing 60 miles an hour, no problem, except for me dealing with all the cars that are passing me. It's, you know, the road says, hey, see how fast you can go, <laughs> you know, and, and that's what's happening. And, I, and I'm serious. I, I did 60 and cars are passing me left and right, and I only traveled on that for about six miles or so. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a, it, it needs to be addressed. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. I don't, do we want to four lane it? Uh, we, we can't have the trucks go away. You know, we, we could probably limit some of the hours. I don't think that's going to make a big difference. It's a heavily traveled road. It has a lot of commercial traffic on it. And I notice, oh yeah, Ken's still in the back. Ken's made a point. He doesn't take Vermont Road. He goes, you know, he, he takes a detour because he doesn't want to drive on it. Because, because when you've got somebody facing you at 55, 60, 65 miles an hour, there's nowhere to go. And the unfortunate thing is, when there are accidents there, they're usually serious accidents. You know, we just closed off uh, Harborview on the access, uh, Harbor on the access road off of 41, and uh, because we know that we're saving a lot of accidents. But those weren't fatal accidents. Most, I think there was one. But there were a lot of fender benders and a lot of accidents there, and we did it. The problem is, because of the speed of the traffic, the accidents on Vermont Road almost always involve very serious injury or death. And I don't know the answer. I think we all know the problem. Uh, maybe you guys have some ideas. And John, appreciate that you're motivated in getting started. And I'm going to touch upon this with some comments later on about some things I've been talking about. But, you know, a major traffic project. This would be a major traffic project if we're going to end up four-laning it or putting shoulders on it or trying to make that roads. I mean, at best, we're looking at 10 years. If we could do it less than that, it would be darn close to a miracle for government to do it. I'm talking from today. So it's a real issue. I think we've got to cooperatively work together and say, how can we save lives and reduce accidents out there? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Tassayo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, John, I appreciate the comments. And for those people who stuck around for this meeting and had concerns about Vermont Road, at our last Board of County Commissioners meeting, um, it was part of the commissioner comments. And we directed staff, we wanted a, a workshop specific to Vermont Road. Um, and I didn't ask my one-on-ones this morning, has that date been set? Or how far are we from getting the information needed to have a workshop? We're, that's probably the better question. I certainly wouldn't schedule the workshop that'd be administrations. Um, um, I think we would probably be a couple weeks away from having at least some real high level, high level preliminary numbers. What kind of right of way corridor would, what would that facilitate as far as costs, four laning, median, what size median, those type of things. Um, but the unknowns in the discussions that we've already had is now, are you going to go be talking, do you want to go ahead and do full utility, everything down through there, which intersections you'd signalize? So it, it kind of, the number I heard today, I'm not even going to say publicly, is extraordinary. Well, and, and I think that's why we need to have the workshop. And um, Vermont Road's been a, a great concern of the county commission for quite some time, but I think it's reached critical mass. Um, the safety issues are big and, and what prompted the workshop 
really is to, to figure out what the first step is to get the ball rolling on improving Vermont Road. And it starts with a workshop to give direction so we can develop numbers, figures, what it looks like. I, I think the answer is, for safety concerns, is it needs to be four-laned. Well, Commissioner, if, if I can jump in, yeah. I, and I think your idea of having the workshop was excellent. I think it's going to turn into a series of workshops. I think, you know, we'll have the first workshop. We'll give them some homework. That they'll tell us it'll take so much more time. It may be another two months. We'll have another workshop item with an update to go forward. And I think you're, you're exactly right. It's going to be a phase in of safety features, phase in of better handling of speeds, phase in of maybe restricting some truck traffic if it makes sense in some way. But I think we, we are pulling all options, putting all options on the table and doing a full court press because we want to make sure that the public understands we see this issue. And, and by the way, as you know, I want to make sure that, that FDOT understands, you know, we invested a lot of money probably 10 years ago in at least elevating that roadway and because it was horrible, at least it was elevated and we worked on the shoulders for drainage so that as far as a two-lane road goes, it's a pretty darn good two-lane road. We, we now need to figure out the next step. And even if we get real estate involved for passing zones and things like that, even that's going to take a long, long time. So Commissioner Deutsch is exactly right. So this is, this is going to be a long-term thing, but I really uh, you know, appreciate the suggestion about the workshop, and I think it's going to be a series of workshops. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. To your point, the workshops, we've kind of already started those transportation style workshops where we even some of the stuff we touched on, like the camera systems with the doing the counts for intersections, those are things that we're looking at. But the real balance that we're going to have to strike here is there's we're just in that air time in Charlotte County's life where we're growing exponentially and it's pick which one and which and how do you want to fund it because you got like burnt store placida road uh just a ton of different huge projects and it's enforcement as part of it as well whether it's you know are the trucks passing the way stations and they shouldn't be or they're overweight more more likely that they're overweight and, and missing up and do we have speed enforcement and right now that the sheriff's deputies are you know he's he's down like 30 or 40 positions i spoke to mr gaither today to find out that FDOT's enforcement group is down, you know, FHP is down. So, and it's not even, you know, they would have to be doing us a favor because it's not even a Florida highway road. It's just, you know, if we asked for somebody to, to station, but I mean, the secretary was very helpful in saying if there are technologies that they can bring to, to bear, you know, and it makes sense for us, they will put them at our disposal. They're not big ticket items, but maybe just the combination of things is, is really, you know, is what we're looking for. To, to do something to pierce this. And that's kind of the, to, to speak back to the workshops, that's some of the, the elements that we're trying to put together with our team to um, provide like lower cost technologies. They're not a speed limit sign, which is 60 bucks in 10 years, you never have to touch it. But putting one of those radar feedback signs at $15,000 probably doesn't last as long, but we can get counts, we can get trends of when people are speeding, what's the worst times, and, and those, those, that technology will gather that information for us. I guess my point was at, the, at our Board of County Commissioners meeting was, you know, we do a lot of talking and we're kind of, I guess, touching the edges here. But starting with the workshop, um, we can get more of a comprehensive view of what needs to be done. And again, it, it won't be done in one workshop, to your point. It'll be a series of workshops as we develop what needs to be done. Like the roundabout ended up, you know, getting approved. That's one component of a safety improvement, which we worked with FDOT because of State Road 31. Um, you know, when you look at a map, you know, I can see where we can work with the state because Vermont Road connects to 27. And that's a four lane road which connects to the other coast. So the continuity of being able to have an evacuation route or east west corridor that's four lane from the east to west coast, there's value there. The same way the state found value in working with us on Harborview Road. I think those are the kind of options, um, you know, once we get together a plan and a direction and where we need to go with this, we can try to call in some of our state, maybe federal partners, to look at options um, to fund this thing. And maybe we can. You know, as an example, get funding for the engineering, you know, PD&E to get things going once we decide what we're going to do and maybe work with the state on that if they find, and I hope the secretary is listening, I am. Yeah, value, val yeah, value in coordinating because it does terminate at 27. 
Am, isn't so right? it's, certain, it's certainly a regional road, and to, to your point, Commissioner, um, I think staff probably meets more often with these groups than, than, than is probably recognized. We probably should do a better job of communicating. We're meeting with FDOT staff all the time on topics like we hear this, Dwayne's getting a hold of us, and we're having conversations. So it's an east-west safety corridor, and it's an east-west commerce corridor. You know, it hits, it touches a lot of things that I think would, you know, be of value to the state. I, I'm sorry. I have Commissioner Deutsch in the queue, and then I'll and then I'll put you in, Mr. Secretary. I'm going to share uh, two issues I think are significantly important, and I've mentioned them at commission meetings. One for about six, seven months, and the other the last few months. And I, I want to share them both because the mayor is here. Uh, if we're going to be start doing transportation workshops, we better start looking down the road. And I'm going to restate what I've said at commission meetings. We've got to start looking at a, and I'll do this one first, it's the least significant right now. We need a second crossing of the Mayaka. And I've been talking about that for about a year or so now. And whether it's going to be a tunnel or a bridge or a beam me across Scotty, uh, we're going to have to look at that. Because if there's a, when there's a problem at 776, and I've experienced both down by Gillette and up between Flamingo and the bridge, and you want to get to the western part of Charlotte County, you're looking at an hour and a half without extra traffic. Because the only way you have to get over to Pl Placida, Rotunda, Gulf Cove, South Gulf Cove, and two of them, ag agreeably, two of the largest growing areas in the county, you got to go to River Road. And thanks to this MPO, we got Sarasota finally looking at River Road. But Mr. Secretary, River Road must be two-laned to Winchester, as quick as you can do it. I'm sorry, four-laned. I meant four-laned. Yeah, it's got to be four-laned and straightened out from 41 to Winchester and eventually to Placida. But more important than that, on the drawing board, we saw to look at a second way of getting over because that bridge on 776 isn't going to be able to handle the traffic for much longer, and you're looking at an hour and a half, two, two and a half hours to get. That's one. And here's the second one. And I don't have a crystal ball, but I think we've all become on this board, our commission, accustomed to looking way down the road to the future. 41, probably in about 20 years, won't have any more access roads because they'll be gone. And all that traffic is going to be going back and forth up 41, which is really great. But then you get to the bridge. And that traffic, the way it stands now, is going to be going over to Punta Gorda. They can't handle the traffic now. About five weeks ago, at the t tail end of, of uh, snowbird season, I was going to a dinner over at the Isles. And I remember I, I was coming off the bridge, it was around 5 o'clock-ish, and I ended up stopping because of traffic in the middle of Hurricane Charlie's parking lot. And, you know, you want gee, should I go up to the corner, make the right turn, come in the back way behind the museum and, you know, get over there? And I said, well, the light changed, it started moving. I only got halfway to the tra I had to wait two traffic lights to make the right turn on Marion. So you know what else we have to start looking at? A second crossing of the Peace River. Because you can't widen it where it is, because there's no place to put that, the volume of cars, Mayor, you know, in downtown Punta Gorda. And I don't know if you guys have talked about it, but if we want to see something happen in 15 to 20 years, we got to start talking about it now. And the second crossing of the Peace River between where, where 41 is now, and the interstate, whether it's a bridge or a tunnel, or Lord knows what it might be, I think we've got to start looking at those things now. Because you know the need's going to be here in five years for sure, and definitely 10, and there's no way we're going to get a project off the ground to deal with those. So I just wanted to get those out there and share this with this group. Um, I, I don't, Mayor, I don't know if you guys have talked about it or you have any ideas, but I'm sure you're aware that it's it's going to be an incredible challenge. And everybody wants to go to Punta Gorda. Uh, yeah, and we're talking about it, to, to put in a garage and this and that, but you still 
the volume of traffic is going to be beyond comprehension if we don't look to a second crossing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to get that out there. And thank you for your patience, Mr. Secretary. I know you can make it happen in less than 10 years. I do, I do have it, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, of course. So I was gonna, I was gonna make another comment um, associated with Vermont Road, but uh, um, the, the path forward is really, Commissioner, you gotta, you gotta get it into your comprehensive plan, and you gotta get it into your long-range transportation plan, right? So whatever vision, right? Those things gotta be reflected in that, so that if you are thinking about leveraging funding through the federal dollars that come in, right? It's got to be reflected in the plan. Even 80-20 is going to have a lot of zeros at the local yeah, end, trust exactly. me. Exactly. So that's, that's my suggestion. But um, re regarding Vermont Road, I do want to mention that, um, you know, the folks from um, Lakewood Village, right, sir, uh, Lakewood Vill Village mentioned the intersection and the turn lane issues and all that stuff. So um, we do have a resurfacing project that's planned. It's going to go into design in the next couple of months. Um, where we've made a decision to evaluate each of the intersections from the Interstate 75 interchange to Vermont Road, all those intersections, and look at what kind of turn lane extensions are needed, turn lane additions are needed, so that we can address any issues that are on US 17. So that will be definitely be looked at. So, okay, just an update for you guys. Okay, very good. Um, one quick question. I'm, I'm going to go back uh, to the possible new interchange item. Just to, to ask the question of do we know what we need to know with regard to the piece of property that's there as far as the approach? I know it's a mile away or half a mile away from the interstate, but for the wide, possible widening of veterans or the interchange that will occur with Rain Tree, you know, we're, we're about to have a real estate deal to sell off a good portion of that. And it, I know that staff has set aside uh, an area on the west side where Yorkshire comes down and on the east side of the, the, the tip of the triangle to Rain Tree. And I just want to make sure that we don't go forward and do a deal and find out later on that, uh, yeah, we needed more space. And the only reason I bring it up is we have no idea where the interchange is going. We have no idea what the design and volumes are going to be. And so I just don't want us making a mistake of having to buy it back at 10 or 50 times what we valued it and gave it away at, sold it at. I mean, right now is where we need to have really good information before we move forward. Mr. Elias? Um, staff working with administration and these preliminary conversations we've had with all the other agencies involved, we've certainly set aside some um, some land at the Bachman track, but these are these are such conceptual things that they're way far out, and we're certainly probably anticipating that there'd be some right away acquisition at some point. But at least where it lines up with veterans, we're trying to have that as much of a consideration as possible. Okay, I, I just want to make sure that you're you know ev that there's really open lines of communication and that everybody is saying, in the worst case scenario, we'll need this much, just so we don't misstep, because I can see it happening in five years or eight years, where it's like, why'd you guys do that? Well, that, we were, that was the best information we were given. Mr. Secretary? Um, Mr. Chair, that's a great point. Why don't we get back with our team and then have them connect with the county staff and maybe we can figure out some concept, even if it is not the location, so that you can preserve that right of way. Very good. Yes, Commissioner Sale. I believe administration and FDOT or real estate services provided each commissioner, Board of County Commissioners, not this commission, because I got a copy of it. I assume everybody got it. It showed uh, highlighted portions of, of land that would be required should we need it. And my assumption was that that covered the limits of what they would need for the type of improvement that would be coming. Um, that's my understanding. That's conceptually, again, without knowing the standard profile that you'd have, but we, we, we preserved what we anticipate would be a pretty significant cross-section of right-of-way that goes through the Bachman Trust. Yeah, it looks significant. Mm -hmm. So I, I just... I, I saw the map, Commissioner. Okay. Again, it's why we have these meetings. Abundance of to, caution. Yeah, exactly. Got I it. just want to make sure so that when things go sideways in five or seven years, of course, this, this meeting will be 
the, the video is non-existent because we only hold it for two years, but somebody will remember that we had that conversation, so you know, we, we tried to do the best we could. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll still be on the board, and you'll be reminded of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I, I appreciate uh, your time to, to go over that one more time. And then, with regard to Vermont Road, excellent points being brought up, and honestly, even though it's not a state road, in your definition, it really should be part of the SIS. And how do we move that up? Because Piper Road, our, our uh, getting Piper Road done to connect 17 to Jones Loop was a game changer. And I think it, it changes how you look at Vermont Road going forward. So is, that, is there anything that helps us to elevate it to be possibly put on the SIS? Um, Mr. Chair, I think this question came up about a year ago or a, year, a couple of years ago, right, we had our strategic and remodel system folks look at it, and the traffic numbers that are on the facility did not get it to qualify for ACES facility, but we'll go back and ask the question again. Do another traffic count. <laughs> now. <laughs> now. <laughs> I think you'll see it. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I guess that dispenses with item number 10. So thank you all from FDOT for that. We really appreciate it. Let's get back to the agenda. All right, next up we have uh, our consent agenda. I move the consent. Second. Motion second to move consent, which is approval of minutes from March 21st, 2022 meeting and the MPO board resolution authorizing FY 2021-2022 transportation disadvantage planning grant agreement. Any discussion? We have a motion to second. Any opposition? Hearing none, the consent agenda moves unanimously. We'll move on now to the now, item 12, which is the 2022 draft final project priorities. Good afternoon, MPO board. This is Lax with Charlotte MPO. Uh, this is the final draft uh, 2022 project priorities. Um, this was The draft was presented back uh, to this board on March 21st. Uh, since then, we uh, received a couple of comments from our TAC members. Uh, those comments were reflected on the agenda item. So this will be the final draft uh, before it goes into your next step, uh, which is coming up next year. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. On the first page, item number two was struck. Hmm? Item number three says Harborview Road from Date Street to I-75. Now, is that in addition to item two, which was struck Melbourne to date, or should it say Melbourne to I-75? Uh, this goes back to a uh, couple of years ago uh, when this board uh, decided to segment uh, the Harborview Road. This board never decided to segment Harborview Road. We've always been interested in moving forward as one complete project, and we've restated that again and again and again and again and again. So. I'm really mystified because this should be on here as a full project. We have the design, we have the money for the right of way purchase, which is assuming it's ongoing now. So the full intent is for us to keep moving forward and maybe construction dollars come in for the first half and then come in for the second half in a timely way. But this is misleading. So I, I really need to kind of have it explained to me as to why because, you know, the, the first part is struck. Right. So, in other words, we were going to do Melbourne to date, and now we're doing date to the highway? Well, uh, I can go back and check uh, the minutes from the previous minutes, uh, previous meetings and see uh, what exactly was uh, told back then. But again, uh, the goal was to segment the project into two segments. From, again, I can go back and check. Uh, the first, uh, the second segment... Uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, yes, please. If I may. Yes. If I may. Yes. So um, I, I want to I want to make it clear that you know working with the county staff as it relates to Harbor View Road, we're kind of working on two parallel paths, right? One is funding through the regular work program development using our regular funding sources between the county and the state using the federal funding that comes formula federal funding. Right. So the first segment is already funded. You know, the right of way design for the entire segment is funded. So right? Melbourne to date. Melbourne to date is already funded. Okay. This particular priority is for the second segment, right? You know, between 
date to I-75. Okay. So the fact that it's stricken through means it's funded? It's funded okay. in our program, that's why, yeah. Okay, well, it, it okay, I just want to make sure that, yes, sir, Commissioner Say. Yeah, in the, in the minutes we just approved, it talks about how the Melbourne Street to Day Street portion was funded for construction and an application requesting construction funds had been received for the section from Dade Street to I-75. Okay. It's right in the minute. However, however, we will be getting this ready for a grant application for the entire project. And if we are successful, then all this is mute. All right, so adopting this the way it's written meets our standard and, and item two is stricken because we've already got it covered and so now we're, we're amending and going from date to the highway. I just wanted to make sure because you know, we've had this discussion so many times, I just want to make sure we're, we're still on the same page. Thank you for that explanation, really appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Move adoption of the identified 2022 project priorities, including the joint trip project priorities with Charlotte and Sarasota Manatee MPO and Lee County MPO for the upcoming FDOT draft tentative work program cycle. Second. My motion second, any discussion? Hearing none, is there any opposition? Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to 13, which is the U.S. Bike, Bicycle Route 15 alignment discussion. Hello, Mr. Chair. So Adventure Cycling Association is going to give a, a brief presentation on the proposed uh, U.S. Bike Route 15 alignment um, pro proposed through Charlotte County, uh, Lee County, and Collier County. Uh, they, they're going to give a, a good overview of their entire proposed uh, segment from from Madison County in, in the Panhandle. Very good. All right. So I'll ask the board. Well, let, let's hear the whole presentation, and then we'll ask questions at the end. Thank you. Um, my name is Patty Huff, and I'm with the Bedger Cycling Association as a volunteer. And for those of you that um, have not seen this presentation, I'll do a little recap of what uh, we've been working on. Uh, let me see. Must be hitting the wrong. Well, the U.S. Bike Route System has been a growing national network of numbered and signed bicycle routes throughout the United States. It was officially approved by, it, when we designate a route, it's officially approved by the state uh, transportation agencies, which is like FDOT and American Association of uh, Street Highways, I mean state highways and transportation officials. And then all of this is coordinated with Adventure Cycling. And Adventure Cycling is a nonprofit organization, and it's our mission to inspire, empower, and connect people to travel by bicycle. We, our goal is to have 50,000 mile route network and maps and organized tours throughout the United States. We published an adventure cycling magazine and we are a national advocate for our bicyclists. We have 53,000 members and adventure cycling originally provided the first blueprint for the very first U.S. bike routes and now is uh, doing the technical support uh, for AASHTO and for the U.S. bike route. And this started in 1982 with the first routes were designated and then it took a little bit over 20 years to get the project restarted with a task force. And Adventure Cycling was uh, the task force that pulled this together and pledged staff support. Ashto in 2008 approved of this process and then the first route was, new route was designated um, in 2011. Now this is a map showing the um, 17,800 miles that have been designated so far in 31 states and in D.C. Um, you'll see that in the state of Florida, we have two uh, different uh, U.S. bike routes. The first one is uh, that was designated in 2014 goes from north of Jacksonville to um, down to Key West. And then U.S. Bike Route 90 goes along the Panhandle across the state to St. Augustine. And we're currently undergoing uh, projects to try to update this. This was originally all on state highways and now we're trying to move to quieter streets and roads and on U.S. Bike Route 1 and 90. The one that we're proposing is the U.S. Bike Route 15 which actually starts in Georgia and then it goes to Madison, Florida. And our proposal is to extend it all the way from Madison 
to Miami and then connect the U.S. Bike Route 1 to go to Key West. There, we're looking for local jurisdictional support, and so we have 19 road owners throughout this U.S. Bike Route 15 extension. DeSoto and Lee counties have already approved the route in their areas, and what we need from FDOT is, um, I mean, from the local jurisdiction is a letter of support or a resolution to FDOT signifying your support. This is a map that will show um, the green line and the red line are the uh, designated route uh, proposal. The green is in the county limits and then the red is in the city limits of Punta Gorda. And here is a more detailed um, map of the Punta Gorda area. And this is coming down uh, Route 7, uh, US 17 that will come into um, the Riverside Drive area and then go across the Harbor Walk and then over to Linear Park and then south to US 41. And this is a list of exactly the, how the route comes in from Arcadia. And you're more familiar with these streets than I am in Punta Gorda, but these are the ones that we presented to the city of Punta Gorda and they approved of this particular route. Now, any changes that we may have in the future, uh, changes can be made, uh, changes can be made uh, twice a year that can be recommended and go to the FDOT. So if anything happens like with Burnt Road, Burnt Store Road, if, when that's completed and people would prefer that route instead of going down 41, that can be uh, changed at the, in the future. And again, as I say, we look for local input. That's why I'm here today and why we go to the different cities and counties. And the, the benefits are, of course, the improved routes for bicyclists. Um, this gives the long distance cyclists an idea of where the best roads are in that particular jurisdiction. And this all has the positive um, effects of health and environmental impacts. And then especially in the small communities like Punta Gorda, this encourages economic development for, um, with bicycle tourism. And then this is my name and Kerry Irons, who was uh, with us earlier today, but he had to leave at four. And so if anybody has any questions at all, I'll go back to look at the map and see if you have any questions on that at all. Well, Ms. Huff, thank you very much for that presentation. Appreciate it. Any questions uh, from the board? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We well, thank you very much. We look forward to working with you. Thanks for all your efforts. Really. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, move that we recommend the MPO board approve the proposed route alignment in Charlotte County. Second. Have a motion second. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I, I think, Mr. Chair, if I could, um, sure. I think one of the important things that the presenter discussed was the ability to amend or change these things twice a year. Right. So should circumstances change, certain roads open, or we identify certain problems, we can at least twice a year take a second bite at the apple. No, I think that's an excellent yeah. point. I, I, I think that's a great feature as well because, you know, right, we can, at least let's get it started, right. and then we can always make changes if they make sense. Any other comments? All right, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, is there any opposition to the motion? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to item number 14, which is the Veterans Boulevard Corridor Planning Study, Existing Conditions Presentation. Mr. Chair, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Wayne Gaither, uh, uh, FDOT for the record. I would like to introduce Babuji, who is with VHB, and he will be giving a presentation on the Veterans Corridor Planning Study, uh, prov uh, providing you an update on the existing conditions. Thank you. For the record, this is Babuji Ambikapati from VHB. And uh, good evening, Chair, and uh, all the commissioners. Thank you. Um, we have, um, he, I'm here to present the Veterans Boulevard uh, corridor uh, existing conditions. So as you all know, the approximate length is 6.9 miles. It starts at uh, the US 41 at the western end and ends at Kings Highway at the eastern end. So here's a brief agenda. The main purpose here is to present the existing conditions. The, one of the main purpose was to improve safety mobility, connectivity, and reliability for people who drive, walk, and bike, and use transit. So some of the concerns raised by 
the county staff was the capacity and operational improvements. Also, to look at the new traffic controls along some uh, steady intersections along the corridor. So in line with the steady purpose, we, um, we will be conducting the safety, operational, and multimodal analysis and identify and prioritize short-term, mid-term, and long-term improvements for the steady intersections as well as for the corridor. So we have a steering committee formed, which includes FDOT, Charlotte County, as well as Charlotte County Pantagoda MPO staff. So um, we looked at the currently programmed improvement projects, and there are no capacity improvement projects uh, identified. Um, there is a sidewalk installation along Harbor Boulevard from Midway Boulevard to Veterans Boulevard. And also in the long range plan, they have uh, in included to expand two mile radius about around the Charlotte, Port Charlotte Town Center for the, uh, for the Trans Charlotte Link bus service. We also looked at the capital improvement program, which provides the road paving schedule. So you can see here from this slide, there are several uh, road paving projects identified along the corridor as well as on the side streets. Uh, we looked at the cost feasible plan. It includes two intersection studies, one at um, Murdoch Circle and Paulson Drive and Veterans Boulevard and also I'd look at the two closely intersections at Peachland Boulevard and Kings Highway. And it also it includes a small roadway connecting veterans and the Rain Tree Boulevard. We also looked at the multimodal improvements identified within the uh, long range transportation plan. Um, throughout the corridor, um, there is imp uh, improvements like in the form of sidewalks or shared use paths um, planned in the uh, long range transportation plan. And we looked at the needs plan, not the cost feasible, but needs plan. That is a plan to widen Veterans Boulevard from four to six lanes, and also uh, widen Loveland Boulevard uh, from two to four lanes. So here you can see some uh, characteristics on the roadway. Um, it's a four lane urban minor arterial. The LOS target is level of service D. The existing ADT ranges anywhere from 22,000 to 30,000 along the project limits. The current contract classification is approximately 40% suburban commercial and 60% suburban residential. The majority of the speed limit ranges from 45 to 55, uh, with a small section from 40 miles from Madaka to Kings Highway. We have 10 study intersections. Five of them are signalized. The unsignalized intersections include Yorkshire, Harbor Boulevard, Orlando Boulevard, Torrington Street, and Loveland Boulevard. As I mentioned, the existing, you can see here the existing uh, context classification. The bicycle facilities, um, you, have, you don't have a bike lane, but um, there is paved shoulders which are being used as a bike lane, uh, for the bicycle traffic. Here you can see the sidewalks. Pretty much the entire steady limit has some kind of sidewalk with the exception of on the, um, from Harbor Boulevard to Loveland Boulevard on one side of the street. There are three culverts within the uh, project limits, and um, you can see that the sufficiency rating is 80 and above, which means that we do not, there's no action needed at this point. As I mentioned, the existing transit, there is no fixed transit routes. However, we have Charlotte County Transit provides mobility on demand service. The lighting conditions, it's present along the full length of the corridor. And at the signalized intersections, lighting is present at least on two approaches. And in the case of unsignalized intersections, lighting is present at least at one uh, corner of the intersection. Yes. Yeah, uh, going back to your existing roadway characteristics, you identified five unsignalized intersections. Yes. Norman is an intersection that's unsignalized, but it's not on the list. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, we um, had, a, uh, as I mentioned, we have a steering committee which identified these intersections to be studied. So, okay. yeah, that's the reason. Okay. Yeah. It just wasn't picked up during the... Uh, based the... upon, um, they identified that this uh, other five intersections are more uh, traffic, you know, okay. has more traffic. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. We also looked at the existing truck and freight. Um, the daily truck percentage ranges anywhere from 8 to 9%. Uh, one thing to note is Veterans Boulevard is not a uh, designated freight route. However, there are two freight distribution centers, one at the western end, the Murdoch Commercial Center, and then the eastern end, the plaza near the Peachland Boulevard and Kings Highway. 
We also looked at the ITS features. Um, we have a, a fiber cable between the uh, along Veterans Boulevard from US 41 to Atwater Street, and traffic signals at US 41, Murdoch Circle, Cochrane, and Atwater are connected to the Charlotte County's ATMS. We looked at the future land use and existing land use, and as I mentioned here, uh, earlier, uh, similar to the context classification, you can see the commercial and industrial land uses next to the corridor from US 41 to Yorkshire, and the remaining portion is pretty much residential. But looking at the future land use, the, the county has identified the Sand Hill DRI, which is close to the Kings Highway and I-75 interchange, as well as the Murdoch Center DRI, which is at the west, as mixed-use developments. As part of the analysis, we looked at the operational analysis for the 10 intersections which I mentioned. And you can see here, um, the two of the intersections are currently operating below uh, the uh, level of service target, namely the Cochrane Boulevard, as well as the Kings Highway. And also the roadway segments between Peachland Boulevard and Kings Highway, as well as the uh, Veterans Boulevard west of Cochrane to Murdoch is uh, found to operate below the level of service target. We also looked at the multimodal analysis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do not have sidewalks from Harbor to uh, Loveland. So you can see that the pedestrian level of service is um, below the level of service target. Other than that, the pedestrian bicycle level of service are at, uh, at par. We also looked at the crash analysis. Um, we looked at five years of data, six years, uh, five years of data. You have a total of 677 six crashes and five fatalities. Uh, within the project limits. Um, we, the, in the vicinity of the intersections, 477, and the mid-segments, 199. And here you can see, among the 10 intersections, six of them have um, crash rates greater than the state average for similar roadway facilities. That's the reason we have identified them as hotspot locations here. And as I mentioned, there are five fatalities. You can see that um, they are placed along the in this, uh, in this slide, you can see one had a uh, collision with the pedestrian, and the other uh, one, uh, all other four are uh, relevant to the, uh, related to the auto, auto accidents. And we also did the field observations, and predominantly the, the westbound is the peak direction in the AM, and the eastbound is the uh, peak direction in the PM. And you can see that uh, we observed that uh, at the signalized intersection, the signal phase sequence was off along veterans between Murdoch Circle and Cochrane. And also, um, with, as I mentioned, the Peachland and Co Kings Highway, we have issues because they are very closely spaced. So you can see that the spillback occurs between those two intersections and uh, also it sometimes goes to the I-75 ramps. We also looked at the um, facilities to see whether they meet the ADA standards. You can see here some of the intersections, the tactile warning, warning pads are available but damaged. But at some other locations, they are available and good. We also, uh, the department provided us the travel demand modeling to understand the traffic forecast for the uh, corridor. We are in the process of developing recommendations at this point, and we'll be presenting it probably in the July board meeting, the recommendations. So as you can see here, uh, we are um, developing the recommendations, and we'll be presenting to the steering committee on Wednesday. and. Once the steering committee approves it, then we'll bring it to the CAC, TAC, and the board in the month of July. Okay. Commissioner Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I want to go back to Norman. I know you said the group left that off, but it's got a full intersection there, uh, median opening, I'm sorry. And the reason I bring it up is because you're looking at Torrington and Orlando. If you live in those residential neighborhoods, which you've identified 60% of the traffic's coming from the residential neighborhoods 40 percent from other commercial or somewhere else whether you're if you live in the torrington area you can get to the orlando signal you can't get there from norman you got to go all the way down the peachland so what i'm saying is you've got two light spaced uh, uh close together two signalizations in the study it would make more sense to add norman in there while you're at it just so we can decide if there's budget constraints i mean at least if you live in the Torrington Orlando neighborhood, you can get to one light through the internal roads. You can't get there from Norman. So there's no light for those people that live in the Norman neighborhood. So I, I'm going to ask this board that we ask them to include Norman uh, in the study. 
uh, you know, to give some direction. I just, I don't know how that, I know a standing committee came up with this, but we're on the commission, so we're looking at the study. That would be my comment. Yeah, we, we will be happy to look at it. Um, I just want to let you know this project is being funded by the department, uh, FDOT, and uh, so we just want to make sure that because yeah. our project managers told that they don't have additional budget to uh, include any, any more else. Well, you know, I, it's funny, but our, our, our board, which is the MPO, MPO board, we didn't give input on which intersections to study. I think uh, Lax, one of your uh, staff member, was there, as well as Robert. He's also a county engineer. They were part of the... Uh, yeah, but we weren't. Okay. Otherwise, I would have made the comments before the study was commissioned. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so I'm just saying, you know, just to me, when you look at Torrington and Orlando, they can get to a light the Norman neighborhood all the way to Peachland, there is no, you can't cross over the canal. Yeah, I, I do see your point because we did, um, one of the CAC yeah, members. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good slide there, yeah. Yeah, so we, one of the CAC members, like uh, after the LK. Um, yes, go ahead, no, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I, you know, I we'll take the comments from the commission here, both the county commission and the MPO board, and we'll make adjustments to the scope. Okay. It should not be that much. We'll cover it. Yeah, if you look at the dot where Orlando and Torrington is, that's where signalizations are being studied. You can get to either one of those lights within that neighborhood. The next one over, you can't see it. It's between the red dot and the blue dot on Loveland. There's Norman Street there. All those people can't get to those signals. Well, can't they go to Loveland? No, there, there's no median cut there to go. Yeah, the Loveland is only a right-in, right-out? Yeah, Loveland's a right-in, right-out. Yeah. What I'm saying is Norman, which is the street next to Loveland, that's got a median cut, a full median cut. Um, that's where a signal should be. Actually, one of the CAC members mentioned that since you can't make, uh, there's no median at Loveland, so people cut through and come to Norman to make a uh, left turn. Yes. So she raises a concern. Yes. So that's why I'm saying Norman should, should have, I would have suggested it be included in this study because Orlando and Torrington folks they can get to either one of those lights within their neighborhood. So they've actually got two. That, that's why we have to have a commissioner live in each district because I didn't, until I looked really tight, I assumed at Loveland it was a full cut, but it's not. So it makes a lot more sense because I'm looking going, but Loveland's where the signal would, I mean, so why not? Yeah, but, if it was, it'd be great. Right, There'd but no Norman makes the most sense because that chunk of most, what, the most eastern part of that area that would be the logical location. And that's where they go. And like I said, you're giving Torrington and Orlando two options to get to a signal, and the people you. on Norman have none. I got you. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. So, and I do think that we appreciate staff, we appreciate the hard work that they do, but I think the commissioner's correct. We really are the decision makers, remember that? So you gotta come back to us and you gotta say, hey, we're not sure, so we want to add this item on for you guys to so bring it here or bring it to a commission meeting. But, you know, we really need to be weighing in a lot earlier. And so appreciate the fact that we're being presented this. And this is exactly why. So we can give good, solid feedback. And that's something that, that has to get done. And this is my district. So yeah, I, 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 I'm with you, Commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, so the study uh, timeline is here. So I'm presenting the uh, um, existing conditions, but we are going to be presenting the draft recommendations to the steering committee on Wednesday. Um, so that's where we are, and then we'll come back to you all in the month of July. Okay, so when you present the draft recommendations, Norman will be included, and you're gonna have to do some fast work before you come back in July to make sure there's a dot there. <laughs> we'll do that, thank, thank you. you. We'll look for that dot, thank you, sir. Great presentation. Any questions or, or further comments? Thank you, sir. Excellent job. Thank, Thank you. you. Very comprehensive. All right, let's move on to, uh, so we, that was just for our consideration. We don't have to vote on that. It's going to come back with more updates, but we did give our feedback. That's wonderful. So we will move on to um, public comments. This is an opportunity for anybody to come and address the MPO on any subject. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name for the record. And I already see Mr. Russell coming forward. Morning, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So Whew, it's been a long one. I'm Richard Russell from Fort Charlotte. Uh, my question is, for the secretary, what is the max on I mean, the uh, minimum distance that you can put signalized intersections apart? Okay, he can't answer now. Just I know, I know. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm throwing it out, yeah. and that's a question I'd like to have somebody get back to me with because if you look in downtown Punta Gorda, 
You got traffic lights like every couple of blocks there, maybe even one block, I think, between Marion and uh, uh, Olympia. Olympia, okay? So my point is, that's 41. Federal, that's a state highway. So I don't know what the problem is. I know there's enough distance between where I'm talking about putting the traffic light at Melbourne and where the entrance is to Sunseeker. And I've given out a design. I hope somebody's passed it along to FDOT. If you haven't, I'm sorry. You should, because I think it's a solution. Uh, I got a couple of things. On Vermont Road, you all been down to Key West? You drive down from Florida City to, to Key Largo? You got a barricade down the middle of the street about this high. Okay, it's two lanes, then you get about three, two or three, three mile sections where you can pass. Okay, those barricades that keep those trucks off of head on collisions. Okay, that's one solution to start out with before you four lane the whole damn road. Okay. Uh, one of the solutions to 41 is raising it like they did 19 up in Clearwater. Just throwing it out, okay? They did that about 30 some years ago. Uh, blinking yellow lights. When you come to a traffic light and you wanna make a left-hand turn and you didn't catch the light, now you sit there and there's no traffic. That, if that was blinking yellow light and you can see there's nobody coming, you could go rather than sitting there wasting gas, okay? There's lots of places here that could be done. Flamingo to 776, a flyover. Because you're going to be making that as a bypass for 41, you don't want people stacking up at the traffic light to make the left on the 776. So a flyover would work there. Um, I noticed we've got airport authority as part of the metropolitan planning. Why isn't the school board part of it? They, they get 50% or more of our uh, taxes that we pay every year on our real estate. I mean, they're part of the metro. Why aren't they here to be part of this? That's my question. So, anyhow, appreciate your time. You all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, public comment on any item, please step forward, state your name. You'll have three minutes. And just pull that mic down a little bit. Uh, once again, for the record, I'm Tom Ansley, and I'm with Lakewood Village. Uh, just a little bit of concern in some of the discussion we're hearing here. I think four-laning... Vermont is not necessarily the answer to our problem. Our problem being the congestion on US 17 and the horrendous noise from the volume of dump trucks. I just want to reemphasize that point so it does not fall through the cracks. Now I'd like to introduce another member of our group who has some comments as well. This is Monica Richardson. She's a member of our HO board. Hello. I'm shorter. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> what he said there is the major problem is the noise, and that by putting four lanes into Vermont Road, which I'm not saying is a bad thing because it's a safety issue, but it's going to make our issue even worse. Um, also, the speed limit on 17 is 55 miles an hour by us. Piper Road is 45, and there's hardly any stoplights. We have like four stoplights in a short distance. So these trucks are all revving up trying to get to the next light, vying for a position. It's a mess. It's, it's very bad there. Um, the comment earlier about the trucks avoiding the way stations is pretty obvious. There's a lot of semi-traffic along with the dump truck traffic that really is probably not supposed to be there. Um, sound wall. Is there a, can they put a sound wall up by the residential areas? to lower the decibels. I mean, that's something else that I'd like to maybe put out there for consideration. We have no sound wall in front of our residential area at all. So that might be a helpful suggestion. <laughs> um, the bicycle route, I'm just like, what? wow. If they put that along where we are already, you're gonna be dealing with some fatalities <laughs> with bicyclists on that stretch of 17. It's really bad. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else wishing to speak? Hi. Ruth Brooks with Lakewood Village as well. And I just want to say, you know, 
in the newspaper which spurred my interest in coming to the meeting um, was the uh, statement that there had to be a stop to the semi trucks coming down Vermont. About six weeks ago, a 20 foot container dumped right in front of our village on the rock, making the turn from Vermont onto 17. It contained, so we were told, it was a 20 foot container full of olive oil. I don't know if that's what was really in it or not. We still, at this point, along US 17, have trenches that have been dug up to absorb the spillage from the container. It is an eyesore and it's a safety measure. And I think that it just rings true again that we have all of these semis, these dump trucks, coming in this morning, sitting at the light at 17 in Vermont. There were 12 dump trucks and three semis waiting. And then what happens is all of this traffic comes on to 17 off of Vermont, and they get to the light, and then they switch lanes, and we are, we are seeing on a regular basis the dump trucks will come out of their left-hand lane, go around the right-hand lane, come up to the, where the light is, where there's the flashing yellow light that you can go if there's clean traffic, and they cut the cars off and go right in front of them. We've got so many problems there at 17 and Vermont, and if you increase it by doing uh, the, the gentleman who said passing and no passing zones that would be you know i would think that that would help the traffic on on vermont i wouldn't travel vermont for anything it's a it's taking your life in your own hands um i just I, something has to be done uh whether it's traffic uh speed it, it, why isn't it patrolled by the by the officers by i mean i know that the CCSO is down with people, but, you know, I mean, we pick up the paper and we see fatalities. You know, I mean, we're all aware that the fatalities are happening at Vermont Road, it, it, and it's, it's very sad. And I would like to suggest that when they were making the presentation, they were talking about the cameras that can be put up, and, and if the DOT would put those cameras up at Vermont and 17 and see the dump trucks that go through the red light because they want to make sure that they get where they're going on time and they cut everybody off. Um, I mean, it's just a disaster out there and I invite any of you to come out as early as six o'clock in the morning and get your coffee. Sit in Winn-Dixie uh, parking lot. That's your time. Thank you Try. very much. Appreciate it. Anybody else wishing to speak? All right. Uh, I think we're. Thank you. Appreciate the public comment. Now on to staff comments. Mr. Harris. Yes, sir. I'll be very brief. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank my, my staff. Uh, this was a very robust agenda, and we had several last minute changes. Wayne called me after hours on Wednesday and had said he wanted to uh, add a supplement to the FDOT report. I did um, oblige that. And we got that added in, got it posted to the website. Uh, we met all our deadlines. So uh, thank you to staff. I really appreciate all their hard work. And as you can see, the staff report, we've been very busy over the past three months again. Lots of coordination there. More coordination to come. Um, uh, I'm loving it. Uh, so I want to just highlight just a few of the things that we coordinated with over the past three months. Um, I did have the privilege of participating in a, a virtual homeowners association meeting with the residents of Burn Store. Uh, Commissioner Con Chair Constance was also there at that meeting. Uh, several of the county staff, uh, City of Punta Gorda planning staff was there. That was a very good productive meeting. It's something that they do annually and hopefully next year we'll, we'll get more um, information beforehand so we can get more people to participate in the HOA. Um, next thing I met with the uh, Charlotte County Economic Development Director. He gave me a lot of good information about a lot of projects that are coming down the pike that may impact transportation. Very good meeting. I want to have a recurring meeting with him uh, to stay on the same page with the economic uh, development in Charlotte County. Uh, we already talked about I-75 Yorkshire Rain Tree. Um, we are going to have another coordination meeting with 
uh, just local staff June 9th. That meeting's already set. It will be at the City of Northport City Hall. Um, I met with the um, Charlotte County Sheriff, introduced myself to him. Uh, very good meeting with him. We, we utilize his limited resources at several of our committee meetings. Uh, we expressed our gratitude for allowing us to you know, continue to use that resource. Um, hopefully we will continue a good relationship with the sheriff. Uh, staff did participate in a bicycle rally at Port Charlotte High School. Uh, this was in response to a fatality uh, of a student there. Uh, uh, Betty Ann Shearer led that up. She did a great job coordinating that and facilitating FDOT uh, staff. With Victoria Peters actually came to that. Uh, our bicycle pedestrian coordinator for District 1, uh, Deborah Chestnut, participated in that. So we appreciate everyone's efforts in uh, putting that together and putting out a proactive safety bicycle uh, safety messages at that, at that event. Uh, we did meet with Billy Hathaway. He came to the MPO and discussed uh, his, his, his role in his new firm, gave us a lot of good info on community-based planning. And then we also met with him again at the uh, Vision Zero workshop. He gave a very good presentation with, along with several others at that workshop. Um, and with that, um, oh, one last thing. I don't want to miss this. Uh, we are taking nominations for the Peggy Walters Award, and we will be presenting that award at the upcoming MPO board meeting. And with that, that's it for my report. Thank, thanks, everybody, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. Appreciate that report and all your hard work. Any, any questions or comments? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, can, you describe, can you describe the Peggy Walters Award for people who might want to nominate somebody? So the Peggy Walters Award is the... Uh, <laughs> Citizens Mobility Award. Uh, it's, it's given out every year for citizens within Charlotte County that have shown extraordinary commitment and dedication to uh, advancing uh, mobility with, within Charlotte County. Uh, it's, it was, um, Yeah, and this is Lance with the uh, Charlotte MPO. Uh, every year we nominate uh, Peggy Walters Award, a citizen who was uh, wheelchair bound. Uh, she passed away uh, not, uh, uh, you know, having a fixed route. So she was a, she was a, a, a dedicated proponent of transportation issues in Charlotte County. So the last time when we did uh, this was uh, in last May. Uh, it was uh, given to Alan Scavernick. Uh, the time, so we are trying to open up for nominations to see if there are any uh, transportation uh, individuals. Uh, it's just the uh, individuals out there in the Charlotte County. So they are uh, the nominations are limited to just they, they do not include the staff or any commissioners, you know per se, to be nominated as the uh, Peggy Walls Award. So with that, I'll rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, down to member uh, member comments. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you have anything? No. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Deutsch. No, a lot of good information. Uh, drive safe. Commissioner Hurston. No comments. Thank you, sir. Madam Mayor. I have nothing. Commissioner Sam. Yeah, I just want to make sure our staff picked up some of, some of the big points today um, regarding DeSoto County. Um, getting them in on the conversation. I want to make sure, I assume administration's listening. I want to make sure that that uh, gets discussed. Um, also, that staff picked up the comment from the secretary regarding Vermont Road and what we need to do to help get it in order for them to look at it regarding future planning uh, that we get into our future programming as a, a key to getting FDOT to look at this project with us. I want to make sure we pick that up. And also, uh, we talked about Norman. Um, so that's taken care of, Norman uh, Boulevard. And regarding the citizens' comments regarding the noise, um, I know that FDOT, when they put in a new road, they do studies to look at mitigating factors for noise. I'm not sure if that's something that can be done after the fact or if it's something that's just done at the planning stages of a road. Because um, I know there are uh, mitigation um, things that, that can be done. And maybe you can speak to that, Mr. Secretary. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, you are correct, Commissioner. W noise walls, noise mitigation measures are looked at when a roadway is being planned. 
any roadway improvements are being done. So any residents who are already there, as we are doing the planning study, will be taken into consideration. And if there is a change in the decibel level and there is a benefit per household that is going to be benefited from the noise mitigation measures, that's when we can actually fund any noise faults. Other than that, we cannot uh, pursue any noise mitigation measures. So, Mr. Secretary, I understand planning a road or improving a road, but if, if a road starts to have much more traffic than it ever had before, and maybe at the time it was planned or expanded, there, were, there was a certain traffic count in mind or a certain level of service, and now it's sort of exceeded that, is there ever an opportunity to go back and, and study it to see if somehow it, the, the estimates were incorrect because you know there seems to be an outcry and maybe just some sort of preliminary look to see? Mr. Chair, not to my knowledge, um, but we'll check into it, definitely, just to make sure, you know, we're not missing anything, but not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, and along those lines, uh, Ms. Ms. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, um, would four-laning Vermont Road allow to take another look in the future if that gets four-laned at noise mitigation at this particular uh, intersection? Mr. Chair, if I may, um, so because the community is running US 17, um, it's got to be made any intersection improvements within that, within that intersection, right? So I would assume that if Vermont Road is being four-lane, then we would be looking at some intersection improvements. So that may actually qualify for us to look at. Yeah. Okay. In, in, in fact, the Vermont Road 17 intersection improvement could happen way before it gets four-lane, and that would trip some sort of could, a noise study could be yeah and i would say to those residents out there that some of the things you're experiencing is has not been uncommon in charlotte county in recent years i've been driving that road for four decades um 17 up to lakeland i went to college up there i'm very familiar with the road it's a much better road when i used to go there it was a two-lane road and now it's four lane so it's a much safer drive decades later than it was when i went up there um, where you live is on a north-south road, 17, and an east-west connector. Those roads are commerce roads. You're going to get truck traffic. Unfortunately, your neighborhood is located right adjacent to it. And what we're experiencing with growth and commerce in Florida in general, people are now using those roads more often. 17 was four-lane for a reason, right? People are using it now. So that was never sold as a residential road. It was always a, you know, uh, I guess an arterial or connector road, whatever the classification is, for commerce, for trucks. You've got agricultural, you've got the mining. It's all part of commerce in Charlotte County. Those mines have been out in Eastern County f forever, for decades. That's where the mining, mining is. That's where we allow it with certain zonings. So those roads were always used for those kind of things. It's just that now what we're seeing is we, as we get busier in Florida, you're just seeing more traffic on roads that were designed to do what they're doing. It handles truck traffic, not to mention it feeds into I-75. So now you've got trucks that are driving from the north, south, and the east converging to get onto the interstate to take their products wherever they need to go. So I think you're seeing it now, what, what the roads were designed to do. And you know, it's going to be tough every time, you know, if somebody chooses to live in an area like that, I, I guess it's kind of buyer beware. You have to understand where you're buying and where you're living. It's next to a, a, a big transportation hub. That's just what it is. You've got Piper Road. You've got the industrial park at the airport. Um, we got the ECAP zone there. All of those things were, were meant to nurture and actually attract commerce for the health and the economy of the county. <clears throat> Not that we're throwing our hands up. You've heard we hear your concerns. We're seeing if there's opportunities to mitigate those noise things in the future. So the good news is you came here today. Everybody heard you. The secretary heard you. And if there's an opportunity to revisit these things, we will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I skipped over. Ms. Bjordahl, do you have any comments? No. Thank you. J just wanted to make sure. Um, Great discussions today. I know the hour is late. Um, we will uh, reconvene again on Monday, July 18th for our next meeting here in Chambers. Appreciate staff, appreciate uh, FDOT staff, and, and everybody, thank you so much, and we are adjourned.